for from now on. Okay. All right. So for the Department of Marriage and Family, there are two important brochures that we have published. One is on church protocol, which is a very helpful guide for your parishes to know how we act in their parishes and some uh, guidelines and rules. And the one that's more pertinent to you today is the booklet online uh, for marriage brochures, uh, or actually for your marriage bulletin. If you wanna use this when you get married, you can customize it with your own name and date of your wedding. And inside the booklet is a full description of the Orthodox wedding service. Um, we usually uh, say that families should um, print enough of these because they are a great souvenir of your wedding and people will take them. Uh, it's a great evangelical tool for the non-Orthodox who attend your weddings to take home and really read about what has happened in the sacrament, um, what the meaning of all of it was. And our couples that have used this have gotten very uh, positive comments as a result of it. So um, um, look that up on the Department of Marriage and Family um, site, antiochian.org and feel free to use it. Um, it's not copyrighted, it's there for you to use if you um, choose to. It is gonna be very important today that you have your packet with you and something to write with because the seminar is meant to be highly interactive. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that through Zoom and so a lot of the actual couple exercises we do, a lot of the fun things that we do in person, we're just not able to do today. So having the packet will help guide you through what we're going to do. A lot of the information you have in this packet we're not gonna go through because we don't have the time. And there are some areas that I had to pull out because we went to, from having a Friday night session for about two to three hours and all day Saturday to just the short time that we have here. So we're going to go through a few things, but a lot of this packet you're going to read as couple exercises and couple times for homework that you'll work on together. I would like to offer uh, my time to you since we're not together and we're not interacting on breaks or at our meal times and things like that as we normally would in the seminar, that you are welcome to Skype me or talk to me about any problem or issue or concern that you may have, or anything that you just want to talk about regarding your marriage. And uh, Sonia has all my contact information. If, you're, if you want to do that, you are welcome to take up some of the time that I normally would have freely given you in the weekend I would have spent with you. God willing that I will be there at some point where we actually will do some of these things together. So we won't miss out on them entirely but I ask for your patience to just help go through this together because uh, it's a different format than what we've ever tried before. I realize that some of us have Zoom fatigue because of our jobs. And so I'm thankful that you're even willing to be here today staring at another screen. Um, so let's make it the best we can and take regular breaks. Um, the first handout that you have is called an Orthodox Equation for Marriage, One Man Plus One Woman Plus One God. I realized after I sent this to Sonia that you got the 20 or the 2000 statistics. There are 2010 statistics that I'll eventually get to you that are much more significant than what you have here. We're not gonna take time. This is one of the things we won't take time to go through because you have it all out here for you. But one of the important things to remember about these statistics that are gathered uh, through all of the organizations that I have listed on the top, all the census organizations and the religious organizations, is that marriage as a foundation has more benefits for society and our culture than any other institution. I taught about this at our um, convention in Grand Rapids about the significance of marriage and what it actually does to fulfill not only us as individuals, but how a good marriage radiates through the foundation of the entire culture and community. This gives you some ideas about when marriage is lacking or when there are problems, how difficult these statistics are. So they're a little alarming and the 2010 are even more alarming 
But that's what we're here today is to avoid some of these pitfalls and build a strong foundation for our marriage. On the back side of this, there is one statement that I'd like you to be especially mindful of. And that is um, that couples, couples who participate in any marriage preparation or enhancement program have better relationships than two thirds of couples that do not participate in a program. So if you have friends that did not go through a marriage enrichment or a preparation seminar, you have this like guarantee, it's like an insurance policy, if you do premarital work to have a relationship that is better than two thirds of your peers. Um, also relationship enhancement or couple communication programs had results of 83% improvement over non-participating couples. So just by being here today puts you in a very elite category of knowing what you need to know to be prepared for your marriage. <clears throat> or as Father James had told me, some of you have been married um, because you couldn't wait for the seminar. You're still early in that foundation to be able to know the things you can get here to build this foundation in a way that will increase your marriage satisfaction and the longevity of your marriage. Okay, um, but please, I, I want you to read through these statistics because it will completely convince you why having a great marriage is really the foundation uh, for the rest of your life and to make it as, as positive and as fulfilling for you as you can. Um, we only have one lecture today, I promise. Everything else is very interactive and we will be talking about uh, how things happen in marriage, what we can do to um, anticipate problems, and what we can also do to um, heal them. So I'm gonna start with your very first handout that says understanding Orthodox marriage is a sacrament. It's gonna be very important for you to write down these answers. And even though my packet is stapled, I love for you to take these packets apart and actually use these things as you're working on uh, couple time and things like that later. And some of them, like the prayer that Father James read, put those up on your icon, your family icon corner, and say those each morning or each evening. Um, and also the prayer for married persons that's in the very front of your program or your packet here. Okay, so the only lecture we have is on the understanding Orthodox marriage as a sacrament. So you'll need to write down this information so you'll remember it. So this is why we're beginning to, to lay this foundation for the Orthodox understanding of marriage. Um, also because Father George and Father James very much want you to understand this as we go into marriage, the importance of it as a sacrament. So to begin, marriage is a sacrament which unites a man and a woman in Christ. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What is the Orthodox perspective on marriage and how can this perspective help us understand how two people can grow in love with each other? These are questions that I'll answer. For the Orthodox, the key New Testament verses concerning marriage are in John 2 and Ephesians 5. And both of these are read during the wedding service and both will provide insights into the nature of Christian marriage. In the book of John, that's the wedding of Cana where Jesus attends the wedding and by attending the wedding and performing his first miracle of changing the water into wine, Christ blesses the marriage and sets it apart as a sanctified way of life. In the second passage in the book of Ephesians, St. Paul describes the responsibilities of the husband and wife. And then he makes the statement, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The word mystery is translated from the Greek word sacrament. Thus, from the very beginning of Christian marriage, the Orthodox Church stands on solid biblical theology when it calls marriage a sacrament. The Church Fathers say that marriage is arranged by the Church, confirmed by the Holy Eucharist, sealed by the blessing, inscribed in heaven by the angels, and written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. To truly understand the Christian view of marriage, 
it will be helpful to understand the two views of marriage which predominated during the time of the New Testament when it was written. The first view was that of the faithful Old Testament Jew. In his way of thinking, the goal and meaning of marriage was to be found in procreation only. God commanded Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. God said to Abram, I will bless you, and in multiplying you, I will multiply your seed upon the earth. Their understanding of God's blessing was in having children. The Psalms even say, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Theologians believe that this emphasis on procreation as the sum of marriage was directly related to the dimness of the Old Testament's vision concerning the afterlife. Although the Israelites were vaguely aware of a continued existence after death, prior to the advent of Christ, God had not yet revealed to the Jew anything about the nature of that existence after death. Therefore, the godly Jew looked, it, looked to perpetuate his life through his offspring. That's why there was a central importance in childbearing and, in many cases, multiple marriages. The second common multiple like polygamy marriages. The second common view of the New Testament era was that of the Roman world, which was reflected in the legal statutes of the first century and which we still have today in Western society. The Romans understood marriage as a legal contract entered into willingly and freely by two parties. Therefore, a slave could not marry a free citizen. This famous principle of Roman law specified that marriage is not in the action of the event, but in the consent to be married. According to Romans, the essence of marriage lies in the consent to be married as a legal contract between two equal parties, a free man and a free woman. So the earliest Christians witnessed both of these views of marriage and yet knew their experience to be much deeper than either the Hebrews or the Romans because of the context of their faith and their Eucharistic communion within the Holy Church. In the New Testament, Christ's work of redemption raises marriage to a level that transcends both human procreation and legal contracts. The New Testament finds that these two views are completely inadequate to express the deep meaning of a sanctified marriage. Christian marriage has become the sacrament of love, according to St. John Chrysostom. It is a unique union of two beings in love who can transcend their own humanity and thus be united not only with each other, but also in Christ. This explains St. Paul's reference to marriage as a mystery. Throughout his writings in the epistle, the term mystery refers to the new life which Christ came to bring mankind. The mystery is the gospel, the pronouncement that man has been reconciled by God, or reconciled to God, and thus can live in and with God. When marriage is proclaimed to be a mystery of the kingdom, it is proclaiming the awesome truth that the relationship between man and woman has been transformed by the death and resurrection of Christ from something purely temporal and of this world into the realm of the eternal. By calling marriage a mystery, St. Paul affirms that marriage takes a place in the eternal kingdom of God. The late Father Meyendorf has said, the husband becomes one single being, one single flesh with his wife, just as the Son of God ceased to be only God and became also man, so that the community of his people may also. That is why the Gospels so often compare the kingdom of God with a wedding feast. And this is why marriage can be not only unique in virtue of some abstract law or ethical precept, but precisely because it is the mystery of the kingdom of God, introducing man and woman into eternal joy and eternal love. St. John Chrysostom also wrote, when a husband and wife are united in marriage, they no longer seem like something earthly, but rather like the image of God himself. Now, 
All of this may sound rather abstract, theological, and unconnected to your relationships, but I would suggest to you that the point being made is of crucial importance for your marriage because marriage is eternal. Even before I, I came to understand the Orthodox perspective in marriage, it always bothered me when I attended weddings in other churches that the wedding vows ended with, in death do we part. It wasn't the death part that bothered me, but the understanding that the marriage ended with a temporal relationship, that the marriage was limited only to this world and it was passing away. What we truly hope for though in our marriages is a relationship that transcends this world and lasts beyond the limits of time, a love which knows no end. Christianity is the consummation of man's deepest longings. It provides the fulfillment of this desire. The Christian gospel proclaims marriage is forever. The sacramental union of a man and woman in a Christian marriage is an eternal union. The uniqueness of a Christian marriage consists in transforming and transfiguring a natural human affection between a man and a woman into an eternal bond of love, which cannot be broken even by death. The goal of marriage is that it is a pathway that leads both the husband and wife in union with God. St. John Chrysostom also said, use marriage chastely and you shall be the first in the kingdom of heaven. St. Alex Clement of Alexandria wrote, marriage is more than human. It is a micro kingdom, a miniature kingdom, which is the little house of the Lord. How different this is from the goal many couples have today as they approach marriage. Very often couples get married to fulfill their personal needs. Therefore, they come to marriage expecting happiness, emotional fulfillment, and personal satisfaction. But they don't, when they don't get these things, they feel cheated and they often blame their spouse. And that is a prescription for divorce. As Orthodox Christians, we approach marriage very differently. The goal of marriage is not the fulfillment of one's needs. Rather, the goal of marriage is heaven. So what does this mean practically for your marriage? The view that I've just described should bring a sense of relief and encouragement. The relief is because as marriage is a sacrament, you don't have to choose between God and your spouse. If you did, you would be a monastic. Our relationship with our future spouse is not a thing of this world. It's of the eternal kingdom. So choose wisely who you will be with for a very long time. The road to God is the road we travel with our partner. We love God by loving our partner. And eventually we will love God by loving our children. We give ourselves completely to our spouse in self-sacrificial lives. This is why we wear the wedding crowns as a sign of martyrdom, as well as a sign of being a king and queen to each other in our own kingdom. Because of the sacrament of marriage, we find God in communion with our spouse, not alone as a single person. And be encouraged by the fact that finding God with our life's partner is something we'll do not only in this world, but throughout all eternity. This is true joy. How empty every other concept of marriage is in comparison. And what an indescribable gift it is for us. However, marriage is also a cross. At the same time that heaven is the goal of marriage, it helps us to understand and explain its more difficult aspects. The way to heaven is the way of the cross. This is the road that Jesus traveled, and it's the same road his followers must travel. Paradoxically, the joy of eternal life is rooted in the pain of the cross. And it is only as we embrace the cross in Jesus' name that we will know the joy and power of the resurrection. If we reject the cross, we reject the joy of the resurrection. St. Paul says the power of Christ's resurrection 
cannot be known apart from his sufferings. This linking of the cross and the resurrection is crucial to understand in your marriage. Any married person knows that every marriage has its cross. No marriage is perfect and no honeymoon lasts forever. Neither will yours. As hard as that may be to believe at this point in your relationship. So you may, you must understand to be, you need to be willing to experience both suffering and joy. The real work of marriage begins after the honeymoon. Both partners will have to learn to give up their self-will, and that is the most difficult part in a marriage. In our modern culture, many people are lost in a world without eternal meaning. It is a nihilistic world, rejecting morals, ethics, philosophies, traditions, and religions, and we're seeing that very much in our society today. A world such as this makes no sense to stay in a marriage when the thrill is gone and the suffering begins. It makes no sense to stay in a marriage if you don't believe in morality or eternity or true love. When the going gets tough, this type of existence says, why stay? But if working through the day-to-day -day difficulties of a marriage relationship becomes part of your labor to at attain the kingdom of God, because it requires denial of self and embracing of selfless love, then it becomes an event of cosmic significance because it involves the overthrow of the satanic pseudo kingdom and the planting of God's kingdom here on earth. Then life has real true meaning because then you're involved in something bigger than yourselves, something that lasts for eternity. This world is empty. It is passing away. Other faiths attempt to take a man of this world and make him a better man of this world. The Orthodox faith takes a man of this world and makes him a man of the world which is to come. The same thing is true about marriage. The best marriage counselor or counseling book available outside the Orthodox faith tries to take a marriage relationship and make it a great relationship of this world. Only orthodoxy takes a relationship and makes it one of the world to come. Now there are many blessings in the wedding service that will provide our foundation and our door into God's kingdom. The prayers of the orthodox wedding are full of references to this transformation that is affected by Christ's hand. Over and over, the priest prays for God's blessing on you and your marriage. One of the prayers says, O most holy master, accept the prayer of your servants, and as you were present there, be present also here with your invisible protection. Bless this marriage and grant these, your servants, a peaceful life, length of days, chastity, love for one another, and the bond of peace long-lived offspring, gratitude from their children, and a crown of glory that does not fade away. Bless them, O Lord our God, as you blessed Abraham and Sarah. Bless them, O Lord our God, as you blessed Jacob and all the patriarchs. Bless them, O Lord our God, as you blessed Joseph and Asenath. Bless them, O Lord our God, as you blessed Moses and Zipporah. Bless them, O Lord God, as you bless Joachim and Anna. Bless them, O Lord God, as you bless Zechariah and Elizabeth. Preserve them, O Lord our God, as you remembered Enoch, Shem, and Elijah. Remember them, O Lord our God, as you remembered the 40 holy martyrs, sending them down crowns from heaven. Give them the fruit of the womb, fair children, concord of soul and body. Exalt them like the cedars of Lebanon, like a luxuriant vine. Bestow on them a rich store of substance, so that they, having a sufficiency of all things for themselves, they may abound in every good work that is good and acceptable before you. Let them see their children's children as newly planted olive trees around their table, so that finding favor before you, they may shine like the stars in heaven, and you are God. I read these prayers to you because. On your wedding day, you'll be so caught up in the moment 
that you won't remember these prayers. But you need to know that all of these blessings are being prayed upon you through the priest and it directly through God in his hand um, in, our ser in our services. These beautiful prayers, they answer all of our deepest desires and our needs as we enter into our marriage, and they proclaim the fullness which God has made available to all those who have entered freely into Christian marriage. Then the couple is crowned with beautiful crowns. The symbolism of the crowns is very rich. The crowns represent the way of martyrdom and remind the couple of their call to self-sacrifice and self-denial in marriage. But these crowns also represent the entrance of this couple as a king and queen in Christ into the joy of the kingdom of heaven. The liturgy makes it clear they are crowned by God himself. At the wedding of Cana, as I mentioned earlier, when Jesus turned the water into wine, he then at each subsequent wedding transforms each human or earthly relationship into a doorway into the eternal, a passageway to true life, an open door into true deified humanity. The Psalm verses following the crowning proclaim this beautifully. You have set upon their heads crowns of precious stones. They ask life of you and you gave it to them. Length of days forever and ever. You will make them most blessed forever. You will gladden them by the joy of your presence. Having been crowned by God, the new couple is made one in and with Christ forever and ever. The final seal or blessing in the sacramental union is the sharing of the common cup. This is not the Eucharist, and it is only for the couple alone to partake of because it represents the mingling of your joys and your sorrows in your life. This cup also represents that the life of the two that will share as a married couple is nothing other than the life of Christ. It's only as you partake of the flesh of Christ that you can be the flesh of each other. The life of your marriage, your shared joys, mutual love, and intimate eternal union is possible only through Christ. This threefold union, the bride, the groom, and Christ, is wonderfully symbolized in the procession around the marriage table. The circle you make symbolizes your own broke, unbroken life together for eternity. The centrality of the cross and the gospel placed on the table in the middle is a powerful reminder that you can only remain together for eternity if you remain together united with Christ. In Orthodox weddings, marriage is not simply an agreement of a man and a woman to share their lives together, nor is it a mere legal sanction. It is not performed by the couple themselves with the clergymen in the congregation as witnesses to their decision. Their union based on their freely willed decision to join their lives as husband and wife becomes sacramental because they are joined together as Orthodox Christians who are members of the Eucharistic community, sharing the body and blood of Christ and receiving the grace of God for their union through the whole church in the presence of the bishop or priest and in the presence of the gathered people of God. Let me finish with three practical applications. First, the logical implication of this teaching is that divorce is contrary to God's will for your married life. Although it is true that the church on the basis of Christ's teachings does allow for divorce, it is only tolerated because of human weakness or sin, and it's certainly never encouraged. God's mercy and grace is greater than our sin, and this includes the sin of divorce. Jesus said, though, from the beginning, this was not so. As you make a decision to be married in Christ, you are freely entering into a union which is eternal and full of God's life. To exit the marriage to divorce is wrong for you, not primarily because you will break a legal contract, as the Romans believed, or do damage to the following generations, which was the Jewish view, although those are both serious issues, 
but the church would insist that ultimately it is wrong and a bad choice because to walk away from your marriage is to walk away from the love of God which is given to you and through the sacrament. If a sacrament can be properly understood as a door to heaven, then the church calls upon you not to shut the door. For in so doing, you are shutting yourselves off from God. The second practical application are the divine resources for preserving your marriage. The sacramental reality that I've discussed means that there are abundant resources available to you to overcome the inevitable difficulties which come with every marriage. We bring with us to us in our marriages a collection of hurts and habits that will create friction and conflict. We are often too proud, arrogant, selfish, angry, unloving, on and on. Were it not for the sacramental marriage, a reality of marriage, it would be hard to have hope for our marriages. As much as you love each other, you will have problems, and some of them will be major. In your own strength, you are not and are not able to overcome them all. The good news is you don't have to. Often couples feel as if nothing can be done to save their marriage. They believe they've made their mistakes and now they're stuck. And the only alternatives they see are to make the best of it or just quit. As Orthodox Christians, we do not subscribe to these beliefs. We believe that there is something that can be done to improve marriage by God's grace. We believe that people can grow and change. Because of this, we believe that marriage has a potential for healing. No marriage is so good that it cannot be made better, and no marriage is so bad that it cannot be improved, provided the persons involved are willing to grow together by God's grace toward the maturity of Christ. Finally, there is a great priority needed in preserving the spiritual perspective in your marriage. The fact that a Christian marriage transcends earthly relationships and ushers the couple together into the kingdom of God should remind you once again that the most important aspects of your relationship are not the material, but the spiritual. The fact that the marriage ceremony is a sacramental service of the church should also remind you that you cannot know the full grace of God outside of living communion with him and through his church especially through regular confession and partaking of the Eucharist. There is nothing the adversary would like better than for you to lose focus in the beginning years of your marriage. You can compare this with beginning to button your shirt in the wrong buttonhole. And as you button up each hole, you will be off all the way to the top. Most couples get married with material plans and goals. This is healthy in the way it's supposed to be. Now is the time to dream together. But be careful, for very often young married couples can become so concerned with meeting their material needs that the spiritual is put on hold or even forgotten. What they don't realize is that, is that they are sowing the seeds of marital disunity and unrest into their newly plowed bed of marriage if they forget the spiritual. Sadly, it is these seeds which later grow into weeds and strangle the love of many marriages. So be wise. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. If you haven't yet completed the journey to your own personal faith, this is the time to complete it. This is your beginning of your new life and your foundation before you are married. Our faith has been passed down to us from our ancestors. Now it must become our own um, if we are to be having the proper foundation that will withstand many years of our lives together. When we see the Olympic torch bearers passing the torch on to the next runner, we should use that as a metaphor that we are also to catch the torch of our faith and run with it to the end of our lives. Don't fall for the lie of this age and say that you are already spiritual and you don't need to do the things the church requires. Spirituality only truly comes about by the discipline of following the guidelines of the church, building a practical daily spirituality 
full of the rituals of the church, the divine liturgies, the great vespers, fasting, feasting, tithing, giving alms, and having daily personal prayer. And once you're married, a devotional time together will ensure the strength of your foundation. Without practicing your faith in very practical, tangible, daily ways, your marriage will be incomplete, lacking the very ingredient you must have to make it successful and fulfilling. But you must begin this focus now, not when you're married or before you're married if possible, so that it will be natural after the ceremony. Don't wait to get started. Don't put this off. Every statistic on successful, long-lasting marriages point to a common faith practice. Nothing else has, a, has the strength of this statistic. That means faith practice is about just not your belief, but it's actually doing what you say you believe and doing it now. In conclusion, I'd like to say that everything that surrounds you in your parish points to the riches of our Orthodox theology. You are incredibly blessed at the Basilica with the vision of godly clergy and the people in your community to provide such a testimony to the true faith. So keep your eyes focused on these blessings by building your lives around them, and your marriage will be greatly enhanced and blessed by God. May our Lord give us all the grace to do so in order to preserve our marriages. Okay. Okay, only lecture done. <laughs> so let's look now at your next part of your package. And you will have here, I want you to look at the bottom graph first. Can you both take that and out and look at it together? And we're gonna spend a couple of quiet moments just looking at that. Please don't talk about it with each other. Just look deeply at it. Can you unmute and tell me what you see? Bases. Who said bases? Okay, there are faces there. How many faces? Six. Six, maybe? It's echoing a little, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, somebody said five, somebody said six. Look deeper. I see nine. Oh, wait, there's nine. Yep, look deeper. There's more than nine. Is anyone not finding the faces? We're all seeing them, okay. All right, so the point of this exercise is, this is called the expectation tree. It is a skeleton of your marriage. Some people can only see a lifeless tree with no leaves like a barren in the winter or a dying tree. Other people, like yourselves, can look deeper and they can actually see the tree is very much alive. There's a lot going on in this tree and there were drawn 11 faces in it, although some people say they can see 13. So, only meant to be 11. But the point of that is, there's a lot hidden in here 
And that's exactly why I call it the skeleton of your marriage, because you will be bringing so many expectations that neither of you see right now into your marriage. And we need to recognize that a lot of what you're bringing to your relationship is not even visible. That's what you're going to get to discover with each other along the, the uh, trail of your married years. Okay, so the next graphic right above it are the three figures. And I'd like for you to take a couple of minutes and read each one down until you see how these figures, uh, where these three stages are. Okay, and I'll have a couple of questions for you. Okay, on these three stages of marriage, which column do you think most couples spend the most time in in their relationship? Just shout it out. maturity. Everyone says that first, but that's actually not true. But thank you for being brave enough to say that. Thank you. Okay. Actually, most couples spend the most time in their marriage in the middle stage, disenchantment. Now, that's not bad news, but it means we all have work to do. The first phase is enchantment or it's also another word for that is the honeymoon phase okay how long does the honeymoon last in most marriages well how long would you say that phase lasts no guesses i would guess like six months to two years top. exactly exactly in six months Depending on the couple, depending on your circumstances, if you're a long distance relationship, it spreads out a little more. Um, if, you, if you cohabit before marriage, you technically don't have a honeymoon period, which is very sad for later for the marriage. Well, the the, chat, the uh, toll that cohabiting together makes before marriage shows up in married life a lot later, okay? so. The thing to remember about the first column, enchantment, is it's unrealistic. It's mostly hormone driven. When we're in love, we have extra hormones that we don't always have later on in life when, when the reality of life settles in. And so we're on this like high that we have when we fall in love and we're being with our, our um, loved one. Okay. But as reality sets in and we begin to see these things in this expectation tree that we didn't realize that was there, that's when the conflicts start. So some of these words that we use to describe the conflict, you maybe have different words with them, are very important because if we don't understand that we're in conflict, we won't know how to get out of it. And mostly it's pretty apparent because we're not agreeing on things together. But the thing is, is that in order for us to move forward into this mature level, we have to work out what is in this middle column. Whatever has got you stuck in there, we have to get that worked out. Okay, so every couple finds the rut they settle into. That's the only way I know how to describe it. Whatever that rut is, whether it's lack of communication, whether it's financial issues, whether it's in-law problems, whatever it is that keeps you stuck will make you begin to feel like I'm never going to get out of this conflict and I'm not going to have a happy marriage. Now, that's not true. 
because the skills and the tools you learn, some of them you'll learn today and others you'll learn at other times, will be the very thing that you'll need to move yourself forward into this mature column. Okay, so who would like to guess what the average uh, life as far as years of a first marriage is in our society today? How long does a first marriage last? Or only marriage, if it's an only marriage? Three years. Three years, wow. Um, that's actually for a little bit later, but you know what? You're, we're getting closer and closer to that date. Okay. The first marriage usually lasts 18 years. The second marriage, if you have a second marriage, is usually half of that. So about nine years. The third marriage, if you have a third marriage, lasts about half of that, three to four years, okay? So that's why we wanna learn this now so that we don't go there in our future. We wanna learn how to deal with the things that are um, like strike points for us that are the conflicts or disagreements so that we'll know how to make our marriage in that mature relationship. Because it's only as we enter into the mature level of marriage that we know the real person that we've married, that we've accepted the warts and blemishes, we've accepted the disagreements about what we believe about things in life or about how we're gonna live our life. We have found peace with that. So if it, marriage is only about 18 years now in today's society, how long do you think it takes, how many years to get into the mature level of a marriage? What would be your guess? Six to 10. Okay, you're right in the normal, what everyone says, but it's actually a lot longer than that. It takes 20 years. It takes 20 years to be in the mature level. And that is only if you work through the things in the middle that keep you moving forward. Okay, that's why marriage preparation, marriage seminars and skills are very important tools in your toolbox to know what to do when you get stuck. Okay, so we have a problem there. Most people quit before they get to the 20 year mark and they don't realize how wonderful marriage can be. That's why we have such a high divorce rate. All right, second thing, when you look at this graph, if you get here in the middle and you get stuck and you don't find a way to move forward, you will always recycle back to the enchantment or the honeymoon phase because it's too painful to stay here for very long, so we don't. As humans, we need to find peace. So we recycle out of there instead of doing the hard work to move forward. The problem with recycling back to the honeymoon phase or the enchantment phase is that we will not do it with the person we are married to. We will do it in a lot of different ways. We will do it with going back and finding more work in our job. Uh, we'll, we'll tend to find a lot of time working just with our kids or spending time with our kids. We'll go out with our friends all the time. We'll go, you know, in the garage and hide and tinker on things. We'll find something, a habit, a hobby, another person that we can be enchanted with again or back in the honeymoon phase. That's how we try to heal. It's the wrong way in a Christian marriage to try to heal. So, Think about your tendencies when life is very stressful for you. What do you like to do? Or how do you distract yourself? Just think for a moment. Uh, you don't have to say anything out loud. Do you have a special go-to activity, a special place you go? What is it that you do? Because that is what you're going to do when the going gets rough in a marriage. You're gonna go back to those things that feel good to you but you won't be doing it with your spouse. And so that's why we gotta hang on in that middle phase so that we can learn what we need to to go forward into a mature relationship. By the way, um, we already said that it's a problem because we only have a marriage that lasts 18 years now and maturity is 20 years, so a lot of couples don't make it before they throw in the towel. 
What is the number one social event in life that breaks up more marriages? Would you care to guess what that is? What social event that most of us go to is responsible for more breakups of marriages or relationships than any other? You're so shy. Work. Work can be that. Work can be a great distraction. But the one I'm getting at is the 20 year high school reunion. Okay. So tell me what's going on at the 20 year high school reunion. How long have you been married about the time you get to your 20 year reunion? Maybe 10 years. Maybe 10 years. It depends on how young you marry. And if you're in a not a very happy time in your marriage, what are you going to do? You're going to recycle back. So why the 20 year reunion? Because at 20 years uh, being out of high school, we're not very old yet. And we still see that we have a big future ahead of us. We've been in our careers for about 10 years, probably our marriages a little less. And if their problems are getting bigger and bigger and we can't tolerate them, we will go back to a time where we were very uh, um, idealistic, visionary. Uh, we romanticized that time sometimes in our lives because we were carefree. And so we will often look around and see old loves or old people that we were attracted to at one time, or we just realize, I've still got a lot of time left and I don't look so bad yet, so maybe there's another chance for me. So that's exactly why high school reunions break up more marriages than any other social event. So if you have not gone, just plan not to go, okay? <laughs> Avoid that temptation. All right, so we've said that it takes almost 20 years to get to that point. It's going to be a lot about what we learned about in our tree, our expectation tree, about how are we gonna find out what we're gonna do about that. So we're gonna turn now to the page called Expectations in Marriage and you're gonna to need to write this down. Does anybody need, let's see, how long have we been going? Would you like five minutes just to stand up and stretch? Cause we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. Okay, please just try to do five minutes. Grab a pencil because this is going to be a big part of what you're going to learn about yourselves today. Okay. Are you learning anything yet? I hope so. Okay. Has it been five minutes? Okay. Give another minute or two. Okay. So I'm going to give you all of the answers on this sheet. Um, and it's going to be really important for you to write them down because what we're learning today is so intense um, that you won't remember these things. And these will be springboards for you to understand um, how you can move forward with your expectations or your assumptions in marriage. So um, if I could just start with um, expectations, like I said with the expectation tree, they're very hidden most of the time, but they set the tone of your relationship. So it's, compare expectations that you bring into your relationship like the ballast in a ship. So you have to have some weight in a ship to keep it um, floating. But if you don't go into the hold and take a good look around as what is down in there, you won't know how to deal with uh, lightening the load or shifting the load so that you can continue to sail in your marriage. So why I say that it sets the tone is that if we don't know where expectations come from because they're hidden, they're even hidden from our own consciences uh, most of the time, 
we won't know how to, to cure this or to make it better. So I'm going to say on the top of this page, we can read through this together. And it says, in general, you will be as happy or disappointed in life based on how your perception of what is happening matches your expectations of what you think should be happening. Your expectations are critical to how happy or satisfied your marriage is to you. Now, marriage researchers report that only 24% of marriages are happy. That's very low. That does not include, by the way, I mean, that's not just a, that's not a Christian statistic. That's a secular statistic. So we're talking about marriages that don't have the tools that you have. So you don't have to be part of that statistic. And how you can stay out of that is by paying attention to what we're going to talk about here. Expectations, I like to compare them to like a high bar at a track meet. And you can either set your expectation bar too high in your marriage, like what you expect to be happening, how things are happening, what you need to be accomplishing and achieving. You can set that so high that you can never achieve it, you can never get over it, and you're constantly marking or knocking the bar down. Or other couples set their expectation bar so low that you can just step over the bar without any effort, and there's no passion in the marriage. There's no excitement about being in the relationship together because there's no challenge. So what we'd like to think of as the right balance of expectations for our relationships is to bring that bar so that you, you can't quite step over it, but you have to make some effort to get over it. And that's what we're ta talking about, about having realistic expectations for the things that we think should be happening in our marriage. Now, whether you know it or not, you have a contract for your marriage. And it's probably not spoken, although you have, you've probably talked to each other about things you'd like to see happen and you've had discussions about when you're going to do certain things. But the thing is, is that there's so much more in there that you haven't discussed that we need to understand where does this come from and how can we begin to kind of dig into what we're bringing into our relationships. Okay, so there are three areas that married researchers have observed in which people have expectations about what should be happening in their relationships. Almost all conflict comes from what you think should be happening. Like you didn't, you didn't say anything to me when you saw me, you didn't text me when you had a break, you didn't, whatever. Often or what our expectations are not met is when conflicts start. So there are three things you need to know as you begin your relationship. The first area that we should have uh, really pay attention to are our boundaries. And this is like our couple boundaries. Boundaries in our life protect us like a fence or like a hedge. And as we become married, we need to have a gate on our relationship for that hedge around us. That gate should be able to swing in and it should be able to go in and out. The gate should also have a lock on it which means you have to decide as a couple, who do you let in, who stays out, and when are they allowed to come in and out? That's what you get to decide for yourself. Couples that have very poor boundaries or very porous boundaries that they don't pay attention to are ones that will get into trouble fairly early in life, okay? So a boundary also means how much dependence or independence is okay in your relationship with each other. Are you very highly independent of each other? That doesn't always lead to a very intimate relationship. So you have to find where each other is in those areas and begin to find the balance or to do the compromise that you need to, to have that kind of proper boundaries with each other, all right? Um, when you get married, you sort of leave your friend group behind for a while. And that's an important thing to remember that we all still need those people, but at different times and in different ways. So that's an example of a boundary issue. Are the guys always going to come over on Saturday night? And or is she always going to go out with her friends on, on a night in the week? How are these boundaries going to be worked out together? That's an important thing. That's what I mean by dependence and independence. So who's inside of your boundaries and who's outside of it? A very important discussion point for you to have. The second one is investment. How much time investment means how much time and effort each partner should feel they need to put into the relationship. 
Okay, so how much time are you going to be spending together as a couple? I have a very specific formula for I've worked with over well I quit counting when I worked with over 25,000 couples. So I've worked with more since then. But what I found is that if you begin to decide early on what is the right way to invest in your relationship, what do you put into the relationship, it's going to go so much more smoothly for you. That also means, you know, how are we going to spend time together? What are we going to do? And the very specific formula that I have for successful marriages is that you have a date night every week. It doesn't have to be an expensive date night, but it's a night for the two of you. And what I'd love to see you do is take this information from the packet each time and go through one topic so that you're talking about things before they became a become a problem for you. The second part of that formula is that every um, month you spend one day away together. Like for example, each month you spend like the first Saturday or whichever Saturday that you need that you do nothing, not work, not friend time, just couple together time. And the third part of that formula is that every three months or four times a year, you go away overnight together. That's the minimum that you need as a couple to stay engaged and to stay communicating with each other. And um, your generation in particular is going to have more time problems than any other and more boundary issues than any other, especially with all of the working from home and our jobs overlapping into our personal lives so that many of us don't even have personal life anymore. You have to understand this is investment into your relationship. And it, we, we, value what we invest in. If we don't want to spend that time together, we don't want to do those things, we're not valuing uh, or putting any investment into it. So that's the right way to start out because then you'll look forward to those times and you won't spend time together just doing, you know, senseless things. They'll be devoted to times together. Okay, the third one, um, control and power. Control and power is all about who makes the decisions in marriage. Uh, is your power shared? How is it shared? For examples, with what issues? Do you share decisions about money, which I hope you do, because that's the number one breakup of marriage is uh, finances. So you need to be communicating about who does what with the checkbook or the credit cards or whatever your uh, investments are very important that you're keeping this completely open with each other who shares the children how do you how do you work out the, that power and control with the children um, who does what who does the home maintenance do you share it or do you just kind of default let it go religious activities remember i said the number one it's like an insurance policy on your relationship to have a spiritual faith practice together that's the only way i know how to put it it's like literally taking out an insurance policy for your relationship. So who's going to make these decisions in your, in your relationship? These are conversations that you have to have before you run into the trouble of arguing over whose area this is. As much as you can share, the better. But some of us can't. Some of us have jobs or responsibilities that one of us has to take on a little bit more, like for example, with the children or with the cooking or with other things in our lives. So these three things are very important. I also wrote that differences in each partner's standards are not as problematic in marriage as the actual meeting of each person's expectations. So to make that clearer, I said, therefore, it is less important that you have different expectations. That's not bad. Different expectations are not bad than if you believe your expectations are not being met. So you're always going to have different expectations because you're two very different people. You may not know that now. <laughs> but you will know that, okay? So meeting each other's expectations are going to be very key to understanding how to move forward. So if you're experiencing any kind of challenge in your relationship, look carefully at these three areas that I just described to you, boundaries, investment, and control and power to determine where the root of your conflict is or where you're frustrated with your expectations or those of your spouse. And then that's when you discuss, you discuss compromise. 
Okay, an important way to discover expectations in your marriage is by uncovering the hidden issues you bring to your marriage. That's what we talked about in the expectation tree. Hidden issues are triggered by events. Often couples never discuss their underlying problems until something happens that causes them to surface. Examples of hidden issues are caring, connection, loyalty, openness, order, security, responsibility. And they also could include recognition, commitment, power and control, which is one you will have from the day you're married until the day you die, power and control, or decision-making about sensitive issues in the marriage. So knowing where these expectations comes from, it's very important, there are three of them. The first one is your family of origin, and that is the most important one because that is the most hidden. Whatever family we came from is how we learned how life works. It starts about the age of two, and we figure out what's expected of us and what we can do, what we cannot do. And so our family of origin builds these things like a hardwiring inside of us. Um, and they're always a hot spot in marriage because even if you are close to your spouse and you've known them for a very long time, you're still going to have problems with expectations from what your family did differently from the other person's family. So this begins, this problem with family of origin begins only when the engagement is formally announced. Only when you've decided to have the ring and the date does this come into play because now you have to figure this out together and one mom is going to want this kind of wedding the other mom's going to want this kind of wedding and you're stuck in the middle for an example of a family of origin issue okay but the role models the point i'm trying to make the role models that you grew up on with your parents they formed assumptions about how everything is supposed to work in a relationship like how your family did conflict how they did roles with each other. Were there male, female roles? What roles did you have? I bet there you'll have role issue um, co um, conflicts as well. How, how are finances done in your family of origin? So you, be, you come into your marriage believing that the way things were done in your family origin is the right way or maybe the only way. And the problem begins is when your partner has they handled, uh, their family has handled things very differently from yours. And that's where you're going to have difficulties is your family of origin expectations. So your job as a newly married couple will be to form a new family, a new we that you will be. And it will be to decide what are your role models going to be now? How are you going to take the best from both families filter out the things that were not helpful and begin to understand how the family of origin operates on this subconscious level. And it just kind of springs up and surprises you. I have a graphic about that later, but we'll get to it when we're done with this. The second thing that um, expectations come from are past relationships. A little bit like family of origin, but it's more like all the relationships in your life have formed your opinions and your expectations. Um, especially if you've had a prior marriage or an intimate relationship. The way to change your expectations is to remember that your relationship with your spouse is not related to those past experiences. Remember I talked about how marriages years diminish with each subsequent marriage. The first marriage 18 years, the second marriage half that, the third marriage a third or half of that. So we have dropped down how many years we are with someone after each marriage, unless you turn this around and you understand that what was then is not now, and you learn how to deal with the problems that you had in your relationships before, um, especially if they were intimate relationships, because there's a bonding that happens during that time that you, um, you will act out of. So if, if you want to make sure that you're understanding your past relationships, and what it will do with you now will be like another way of preserving your marriage and not, re, not putting it all in the same bag, so to speak, all right? The third thing is cultural differences. Cultural differences are like ethnic backgrounds, your religious preferences, uh, the media's influence, 
all of these contribute to your adult expectations. So think for a minute, what TV shows or programs were you watching when you were growing up? And talk to your spouse about what were they watching? Because what you were watching and what you were being fed is exactly who you become. And those things, if they're very different, it's another way that you're saying, this is the way things need to be. This is the right way to be because of the cultural influence that you've grown up watching. Now, what was your neighborhood like as a child compared to your spouse's neighborhood? And what is it like now? You know, things change over the course of years. And so what you grew up with, you will probably have the expectation it should be like even now. Okay, so for example, I live in Nebraska. At least I have a husband and a home here. I'm not here very often. But um, we have our state model is the good life. And it really is. I live in a cul-de-sac. And in the cul-de-sac, the men cut the grass after work. They wash their cars. They grill outside. And they roll out the trash canisters each week. The women do the marketing. They transport the kids and some garden. So that's an example of how our lives can be very different. Now, if I would have married someone who lived in the city and had no kind of suburban lifestyle, we would already be at odds. So I think you're getting, getting the picture here of what I'm saying. What you grew up hearing, what you grew up knowing, watching, was feeding you to believe who you should be at this point, okay? Um, so cultural differences are so important today because we marry long distance from families. So, you know, at the turn of the century, really up until about 100 years ago, people married within six miles of where they grew up. Did you know that? Today, we meet people on the internet and we form relationships from someone completely different from a different part of the world. And we have no common ground in a lot of ways. So, if you grew up six miles from the person you married, you know everybody in that area. That's not even a day's walk. You know everybody's family and for generations. And you grew up in a very culturally similar situation. Today's relationship could not be more different than that. So the other thing is, is that we live very long lives now. Is anyone here, any females here born after 2000? Any of you born after the year 2000? I don't see any hands, but females born after 2000 have now have the life expectancy of age 100. Nowhere in history has that ever been possible for a society, Western society, to have such long lives. But at the turn of the century in the 1900s, the So people married and had children. They may have lived to see their grandchildren, hardly ever to see their great-grandchildren. So marriages didn't last very long. Now, do you know that the, first, the, age, uh, the average age in the first century, which is where I took my research for the first lecture that we had, was only 29 years, the first century. So you barely, I mean, they married much younger, of course, but um, you barely had any life before your life was over. And we're talking about in Roman times where they had health care, where they had wonderful homes. They had uh, things that other societies in the world did not have. And the average age was 29. So today we have a challenge in that we live together so many more years than most people ever even lived. So our cultural influencers are very important to understand the length of power they will have in our lives. It won't be like 15, 20 years. It will be our whole lives that we'll be struggling with some of the things that we grew up with differently. So please take time and talk about your cultural influences as far as what, what they bring to your relationship or what challenges they might pose. Okay, so at this time, we usually do a couple exercises. It's a lot of fun, but we can't do it now because we're separated from each other. So we'll have to go on and we'll talk about the rest of this is what do we do about our expectations? Okay. The first thing that we have to do about our expectations is to become a beware of what you expect. That's the first answer in that section. 
be aware of what you expect, which is what we've just talked about and the influences that they came from will bring about that awareness for you. But that's gonna take some time to communicate. Okay, um, many expectations are unconscious, but they form the contract for your marriage. The problem comes in when you don't know what's in the contract when you get married. Do you know that you both have a marriage contract? I would give you both a piece of paper, each couple, their own, um, the male and the female, their own piece of paper, and I would say, write down your expectations for your marriage. And as you would write those down, they would be very practical things, maybe not some, but some would be on your dream list, but your expectations for your relationship are your marriage contract. And then what we do is we trade sheets and you read your fiance's or your spouse's expectations and you understand the contract they have. This is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way our marriage is supposed to function. That's what I mean about a marriage contract. And honestly, it comes from the things that I explained to you before. So we have to become aware of these things as our first step. Okay, um, awareness is always the first step to uncovering your expectations. Otherwise, um, expectations put us on automatic pilot. And we just keep going on, and, and, but we get frustrated with why are things not working? Why does this other person expect something different than I do? I thought we were in agreement. I thought we were in love. All of that. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with understanding the root of where your expectations have come from. Okay. Um, a red flag in your marriage that you should think of is whenever you're disappointed to stop and consider what hidden expectation you had. Think of it as this red flag waving, just waving. This is like a stop, stop, pay attention kind of moment. When you're disappointed with something the other person did or did not do, that goes back to what your expectation, like I said in the first sentence, is what should be happening, your expectation. And so that's gonna cause a conflict. Okay, so remember that. Disappointment means pay attention. Talk about what's going on. The second thing is being reasonable in what you expect. You'll find as you do these exercises together, which unfortunately you'll have to do together because we can't do them as a group in this format. Um, many of these expectations are not realistic or um, reasonable because for example, one of them, which is a common unconscious one, is that your spouse or your fiance should always agree with you. If you really loved me, you would, Believe what I believe. If you really cared for me, you would do what I want you to do. That's not always going to happen. And so you have to evaluate the reasonableness of your expectation, especially if you're not communicating clearly what they are. And so that's why you have to spend some time on this exercise when we're done here. Make it a date night exercise or something where you actually think through what you're bringing to the relationship. All right, the third thing is, being clear about what you expect. And I touched on that just a moment ago. If your spouse doesn't know clearly what your expectations are, their actions can be interpreted as intentionally neglectful when they are not met. Expectations simply have to be communicated clearly. Now, I have to make a gender comment about this because we have very different rules between genders on how we communicate. Females are notoriously bad about hinting and about thinking you should read their mind because we're very intuitive creatures. It's how God made us. And we sense and feel other people's feelings without necessarily having to discuss it a lot. That's part of how God made us as the chief nurturers in our family, okay? But when we put that on a man who doesn't communicate like that at all, a male, communication would be to say exactly what they want and that's it. Females don't do that. We hint, we kind of walk around things, we kind of expect you to understand what we're thinking. If you really loved us, you would know us that well and that's just not true. It's just a false expectation. So guys, pay attention if that's happening in your relationships because 
we're not often even aware of it. It's like part of our hardwiring too. And help us understand how to communicate to you what our needs are. Not to hint, not to think you can read our minds, but to try to draw that out of your wife, okay? It will solve a lot of issues if you're able to be honest about your communication. Also, females are often socialized not to say exactly what they want or to ask for what they want. We see this a lot in business, but in, in families is the same way too. Depending on the kind of family that you grew up in, uh, that will affect your relationship very much like that. So the, one of the kindest and most loving things a man can do for his spouse is to help her find her voice and explain what exactly does she want, okay? This is going to be very important when we talk about intimacy later. But you have to have this kind of communication intimacy first. Does that make sense? Okay, all right. I do a whole seminar on gender communication, which is really very funny. I wish we could do it today, but we'll have to save that for a marriage seminar later. Okay, the last thing, number four, is being motivated to meet the other person's expectations, even if you don't have the same desires. Like giving of ourself is really and truly the kindest way to show love to your partner. And this why is why early in a marriage, everything goes so well. Because when you're early in a relationship during the honeymoon phase, you're trying to do everything the other person wants. You're trying to be kind and you're trying to, you know, walk carefully around any issues. But as the honeymoon phase wears off, that veneer also wears thin and we become irritated by the things that we haven't paid attention to. So being able to be uh, motivated to understand what is it that my, my person needs? What is it that they... Um, what are they needed? We have to, what are they needing in our relationship? So we have to pay attention to those things that please our partner. Um, so that means in today's day and age, as I've already said, time is a huge conflict. We honestly have to focus some energy on meeting our partner's needs and expectations in order to please them. And it will pay off with very many rewards. But this is an area that it just takes time. So, for example, being the female communicator that I am, I asked my husband one time, would you please put some, hang some um, frames up here because we have company coming, and I would really love to have those up before they come. So, we have communication rules in our relationship where we will say something to each other about what we'd like to have, and then, um, in order not to nag, we will put it in a written note and put it out where the person can see it as a reminder, maybe a week later, a few days later, especially if there's a time deadline. And then if that person doesn't follow through in it, we will find a way to make that happen for ourselves without bitter or resentment, okay? So for example, my husband's very, very busy. I'm sure as you are too. He forgets that I ask him, please hang the frames. And he forgets that I've sent him a note and he just is not intentionally doing this to ignore my, what I need. I have to realize that either I'm gonna to have to deal with not having the frames up or I'm gonna find a way to do it. And so what I do is if he is not, I don't blame him for a lack of motivation. I don't blame him for any, any intentional issue. I just chalk it up to, you know, life just catches up with you, okay? So let's say my birthday is in a week or two. And he asked me, what would you like for your birthday? And I say, well, the thing I would really love to have is a high-speed reversible drill. And he goes, oh, no, I forgot the frames. He knows I don't want a high-speed reversible drill. By the way, I have one and I use it because he's not always here. So this is an example of what I'm saying. I didn't hint. I said exactly what I needed. I gave a time frame and I also followed up with a note. I didn't nag or blame and say, you know, if you would have loved me enough, you would have done this for me. None of that happens when you have good communication rules. Okay, but we have to be motivated in order to follow through on the needs that our spouse is asking for. Okay, so what can you do when your expectations are not met? Okay, you can pout, you can sulk, you can be angry, or you can learn to communicate your expectations very clearly. And then, like in the example I just gave you, if your partner is just not able to meet those expectations, find a way to meet them for yourself. 
So you can also learn in marriage some self-soothing skills, some emotion regulation, and um, some healthy grieving. For example, realizing that your partner is never going to be this person that you had them on the pedestal of. And that's a way of letting go of some unrealistic expectations. Okay. After all, we all are human and we can't all be 100% all the time. The other thing you can do is to develop a well-rounded support system of friends and interest. You can do, learn to do things for yourself. That takes a conflict off the table. That takes blame and shame out of the relationship. Okay? All right, so I have a formula if you're a man or a recipe for your, if you're a woman at the bottom here for expectation. Okay, because remember I said gender, communication is very gender-based. So that formula is expectation increases behavior by three times, both positively and negatively. And I'm going to explain exactly what that means. For example, if you raise a child and you're saying, this child is going to do fantastic. They're going to do all of the, the things they need to be successful in life. You're giving them positive messages. That is going to not only increase their behavior a little bit. Scientifically, we know that behavior is increased three times. That's a huge payback for a, words of encouragement, but it also works in the opposite. My child's never going to do well. My child can't learn. You know, I, I don't know what, what's going on with them. You know, they don't seem to care about anything. That child will increase that negative behavior not by double, but by three times. So that's a powerful formula or recipe for understanding our behavior with each other. So if we come into our relationships with positive expectations, we are going to get so much more in return because we automatically will rise to that level of three times what the expectation is. Okay. So now you have an understanding about how to make some changes that you might need for your relationship. You'll have to be patient with each other, though, because learning new things and practicing them is not in our nature, especially if they've come from those deep family of origin or past relationship problems. Um, it takes time to be able to try them out. And, you know, um, we learn by trying and we learn by failing. We learn more by failing by far than by succeeding. So we figure out all that doesn't work first before we can become successful in most cases. So you're gonna fail, you're gonna disappoint each other, but you also know now some ways to be able to get back on track and start working towards that uh, maturity level of a relationship, to get out of that rut of the disenchantment part of your marriage. Okay, my last statement here is your expectations have the potential to trigger the biggest challenges in your relationship. So you will have to spend time communicating and evaluating these challenges together in order for the marriage to thrive. When you have some private time together, examine um, this handout in your relationship and see where your, your um, relationship can improve. And perhaps you know your relationship has been suffering before now just because you didn't have this information. But now you have it. So now you can learn from it. Now you can put your life on track and um, have a key or a real tool right now in your toolbox that are that's going to work for you for the future okay i would like to see if anyone has a question about this because we went through this very quickly we did not do the exercises that reinforce it um, they take a lot of time but they're very they're very good to do so what would you like to ask me or if anyone has anything to ask me at this point Have you seen people reach the maturity stage like faster than 20 years? Yes. If they have very good family backgrounds, um, if their families were similar in a lot of ways, um, if there aren't a lot of things pulling them apart, you know, with their families. Um, I, honestly, though, it couldn't be faster than 10 years because um, I, I do this whole seminar again on the stages of marriage. And it takes time for each stage to build upon the other like steps 
And at every stage in your marriage, you have specific tasks that have to be fulfilled before you can move to the next phase. Now, it doesn't need, necessarily mean chronological years, but most of the time it takes that much time to plow the marriage, to plant the seeds, to reach the harvest, okay? It's not like a, you know, a snap quick thing. It ha the work has to be done is what, is what I, I think is the most important thing. Now, work doesn't have to be uh, unpleasant. Work can, you can find lots of ways to work on the marriage that are fun, that are relaxing, that, are, that have a lot of humor in them. You can laugh at each other, laugh at yourselves and not take it personal and you can get there faster. But it's when we dig in deep with what we want and we won't move forward, we won't give the other person what they want, you're not gonna get there. Okay, thank you for that question because that's a really good way of putting it. I also have a, another question on that yes. point. Um, you talked about how the enchantment phase was anywhere from like six years to, sorry, six months to two years, or it yes. can be longer if you're a right. long distance relationship. Mm -hmm. And then there's the maturity phase, which is anywhere from 10 years to 20 years out. And that most people stay in the, the disenchantment phase. Right. But obviously I like to, I, I would hope to think that the disenchantment phase isn't this huge chunk of time where we're just unhappy. No. Right, um, right. So maybe yeah. you can, uh, you know, yes, expand yes. upon that a little so, bit more and what, what's yes. involved. Yes, so that's exactly what I don't want you to think. I don't want you to think that you're doomed, just you're stuck in the middle because even though you spend the most time there, as you get to know each other and you use your tools and your skills, you jump out of it faster. And you're constantly, as you're working through things, you move forward and you get like a foretaste of what the mature relationship will be. It's just that you have to grow enough to be able to stay there. So you will always have that feeling of we are in a, a mature place right now and we're doing well, but every time a conflict happens, it will put you back just a little, but you don't stay there. That's the most important thing that you can say today. Uh, it's not it's exactly what you said. It's not the majority of your time. It's just, you keep going back to it, keep going back to it until you work it out. But I can promise you, if you're using the tools that I'm giving you today, that will not be the case for you. Remember, this I'm telling you statistically what is normal in marriage, but you have tools that other marriages don't have that have to deal with this and give up as a result of nothing works or they don't want to do the work. So yes, so you will understand what mature love feels like. And it, hopefully it will feel so wonderful and so freeing that you'll want to do whatever work needs to be done to stay there. Okay. So there's lots of hope, lots of hope. Thank you. I have a quick question. Um, since we didn't get to do the exercises together here today, um, can you share a little bit about how we can do those on our own? Or, you know, okay. Yeah. Now, if I, um, if I do come for a marriage seminar at some point, we will do these and we'll do more. Okay. One of the things that we have to be able to do, and I, I give, I have lots of little gifts for you to give you, but it wouldn't have mattered because we couldn't use them. So one of the things I give to all of my people is a little piece of my couples is a little piece of flooring. See this little piece of pliable flooring. You can get it at Lowe's or Home Depot. It's a sample. Okay, what we do with this is we practice communication by one person holding this, holding the floor, so to speak, or having the floor, see the metaphor. And then when we're done, we pass it to our partner. And as they hold the floor, you're not to interrupt. There's a lot of rules. You're not to interrupt. You're to listen carefully to what they're saying. You're letting them have the time that they need to have an equal voice in your relationship. This is a powerful little exercise because um, in, in marriages, we often pick someone very different than ourselves. And there's a reason for that. There's a psychological and a spiritual reason for that. We do that because we know on a subconscious level, a person who's different from us will balance us. They have what we don't have. They have what we need and vice versa. But that often means that one is more verbal, one is more quiet. Introverts often marry extroverts and vice versa. So we have to learn how to pull each other up to the same level and keep that balance as even as we can for all of our needs to be met. 
So the floor exercise is very important. You can get one of those and start doing that for your relationship if you want, especially if it's difficult for you to talk or if you're in conflict, you hold on to that as you're talking. And we have a technique that we use with that. The other thing I have for you is a one minute egg timer, not an egg timer, but it's a timer. You can find these in school supply stores, just one minute, um, lots of places. And what we do is we use this as a communication tool. So one person speaks the entire time the sand is coming down until it's done. For some people, one minute is a very long time to express their feelings. And during that time, the other partner can't uh, interrupt, can't try to translate what they're saying, can't try to speak for them or correct their words, all of those kind of things. So that gives you equal time and opportunity. And it's a disciplinary tool in the sense that you both learn to kind of hold back your impulse, have some impulse control, and really begin to listen to the other person. The reason why this is powerful is because in our world today, we are multitasking so much that we're never really fully paying attention. And so we say things to each other all the time. Now my minute just finished. We say things to each other all the time, but we're really not absorbing it. And until we begin to really set time aside for each other by using the floor exercise or the timer exercise, we're not getting that focused concentration and attention that we need away from our devices, away from any other distractions around us so that we can begin to move forward and to have that mature level. You know, honestly, couples, and you probably know this if you have parents that have been married for a long time, once they're in that mature relationship, they don't really even have to talk a lot anymore, do they? They're just kind of happy being together. It's like what's been said has been said and they know each other so well, that's why they finish each other's sentences. That's why they have the same thoughts. They become more and more similar because they have worked out their differences in their marriage and they have achieved that balance. So that's what one of the fruit of the peace in a mature relationship is. It's not pulling apart with each other. It's not a tug of war like this, uh, like the um, disenchantment phase is. It's a natural relaxing of the relationship and uh, believing the best you know, communicating the positive things and really and truly being there for your person. Okay, so those two things you can do at home um, just so that you both are able to communicate together. The most important thing is that you do it for the amount of time that you need to do it for. Remember I said females have a really difficult time saying exactly what we want. Well, you could use the egg timer or the, the one minute timer to, for one minute, you can say everything that you want or everything that you don't want. Whatever it is, we need to be able to verbalize so that the other person knows what's going on on the subconscious level and they're not trying to read our thoughts or intuit what we're saying and then get it wrong because they're not you. So they couldn't possibly know what that is. Not at an early relationship stage, okay? <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I think in your, in your- Peggy, do you mind before we go on, since we're kind of close to noon, yeah. um, do, do you, I know that we have a lot more to get through. Do you mind if we take the break now, since we um, took a quick break earlier, but maybe now we'll take a little bit longer. Is that okay? Since it's yes, kind of a natural- that's, that's great. Can I make two more comments to finish this section? You have in here, I, I gave you a page called Understanding Emotions. Um, this is something you need to read through together as a couple and discuss what, how you feel about these and how you express them. Um, I put these together because one person may value emotions more than another, but they don't really know what they're taught, what they're definition or how they work in a relationship. So this is a homework page, understanding emotions, or a date night page. Okay, the other thing I want to say is that I do a lot with self-care for people because, and I gave you some self-care strategies. These are just suggestions, but they touch on all these different areas of your life 
that you need to be paying attention to. When you're not happy with what's going on in your life, you'll never be happy with what's going on in your couple life. And the only way you will get to that is if you are taking care of yourself. And there are a number of areas of our life we have to pay attention to, but we're often too rushed and we're not doing um, any of these things for ourselves because we're doing it for other people, our job or whatever. And we need to pull some of that energy back for ourselves so that we have it to give to our spouse first and foremost, okay? So this is another thing where we have a goal thing we're gonna do at the end. This can be one of your goals that you can begin to do as a couple, okay? Don't ignore this because to stay balanced mentally, psychologically, physiologically, and spiritually, you have to be doing these things for each other, okay? All right, and we can take a break now if you'd like. Thank you. So should we say 10 after 12? That's about 15 minutes. That's fine with me. Whatever works for you. Okay. Thank you. So does everybody get that? So at 1210 on the dot, please be back here. Um, again, feel free to, you know, get up, do what you have to do. And then, so you have about 15, actually 16 minutes. So um, we'll see you in just in a few yeah. more minutes. And if, if they need to eat while we're talking, that's okay too. You know. Yeah, you can always turn off the yeah. video if you need for a few minutes or something like that if you're doing something and then um, and then you know obviously come back. So I'm gonna pause the recording now for the next few okay. minutes. And Thank we'll see you. you all at 10 after 12. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Welcome back. Okay, so one of the things next in your um, packet after your self-care strategies is uh, how to communicate constructively. This is another one of the exercises we can't do today, but the, um, reading through this together and practicing this, and especially this little um, four-step communication tool that I gave you is a very important. Uh, and we would spend some time working on that together um, if we had more time. But I want to transition now into, and also on the back, there's another for a communication page that will help you with that. I want to transfer now into conflict because communication and conflict dovetail so well that you're going to learn a lot through the conflict thing about communication. So we're going to jump to the, um, this page here. I call it the fire swamp. Have any of you seen uh, the movie, The Princess Bride? Oh my gosh, <laughs> you got to rent The Princess Bride. It's a classic. It's a very classic, okay. So in The Princess Bride, there's Wesley and Buttercup. And there's a place called the Fire Swamp in it. And the, you have to go through the Fire Swamp to complete your mission or whatever's happening in the movie. I won't, I won't spoil it for you. But the fire swamp has all of these little explosions that happen and you have to learn to anticipate them or you get burned up by them or you get, there's lots of obstacles. It's like going through a gauntlet. So that's why this uh, graphic is the way that it is. So in relationships, there are top level issues. You see that here in that section. And then there are hidden issues in every relationship. Or we call these the seven conflicts or the seven most important issues in life. So if you look in the bigger uh, sections, you'll see caring, acceptance, control, safety and security, integrity, commitment, and recognition. Those are the roots of every conflict that we will ever have, whether it's with a spouse or a family member or a coworker. Something has touched on those issues down here deep that causes them to rise up into all the little issues here. And if they're not dealt with, they literally explode on the surface, like the fire swamp in the movie. So when someone is 
triggering you for whatever reason, think about where does that come from? Where is the root of that? Does it feel like they're not being caring? Because that's one of the seven basic needs. Does it feel like they're controlling? Does it feel like they're not accepting or they're not providing safety or security? All of these areas are for you to look at and carefully think through when you're beginning to do conflict work. So the time to talk about these things is, and, and remember, hidden issues come from expectations. That's why we did the whole uh, time on expectations and how they're subconscious and what, why we bring them in to our relationship. But these are the bedrock of those conflicts. Okay, are there actually, actually also seven needs. Okay, so this is something you will look at together and you will begin to understand a little bit more as we go over to the next exercise, which is one you're gonna fill out and that's where Eve is upset with Adam because he's not picking up his clothes in the forest, see? Okay, obstacles to a healthy marriage. Okay, the first obstacle is always conflict and there are called four red flags or some people call them the four horsemen of the apocalypse in a relationship. Okay, the first one is criticism. <clears throat> You'll need to write this down, criticism. Whenever we're critical, we're not loving. The, the thing about this is though, is that we often criticize what we need. We'll often say things in critical statements like, well, you never, or you always, or you forgot. And so our criticism actually becomes a way for us to understand the other person's needs. They're asking for something, but in a very ineffective way. That's what criticism is. Okay, defensiveness is the second horseman of the apocalypse. Whenever we become defensive, we cannot ever understand the other person's view. We can't take a stand back and look at how we contribute to something because we're in this um, survival mode of trying to protect ourselves. That's all defensiveness is. It's your survival mode kicking in in order for you to be able to withstand the conflict, okay? The third one is contempt. Contempt is a particularly uh, relationship destroying attitude because contempt is when you have a strong dislike of a person or of their behaviors. If you begin to have contempt in a relationship, it's dissolving very quickly, the relationship is. The fourth one <clears throat> is stonewalling. Stonewalling is when we shut down and we re when we refuse to engage. We're just not able to love someone if we stonewall and we shut down around them. So the thing you need to know about this is that the human heart cannot hold opposing emotions. It is not possible for the human heart to love and hate at the same moment, to be apathetic and very caring at the same moment. It's not how we're made. We have one emotion or we have the other. And then later we can learn to have degrees of those emotions as we mature. Okay, anger and B on this. Anger is another destructive force because it cancels passion in a relationship. And so what are the ways to deal with anger? We're gonna do a little exercise after this, but quickly. You recognize that anger is a normal human emotion. It's a normal sort of energy. I call anger, angergy in therapy because anger produces an energy that either moves you forward and motivates you to get out of a bad situation or it burns the house down <clears throat> in negative ways, okay? So you all have angergy when you're angry and you get to choose because it's neutral at first. Anger is a protective mechanism, but then it needs to be expressed. It needs to get out of the body. What you choose to do with that makes it either good or not so good. So remember when you're in an angry situation, there's an energy you've got to deal with, okay? All right, two, don't deny you have anger. <clears throat> Women and children are especially bad about denying that they're upset about something. For some reason in our society, it's okay for a man to say he's angry, but women and children don't have that same expectation. So when someone is angry, don't take it away or don't repress it yourself. Express it, but express it in a healthy way. All right, 
Release your vindictiveness is number three. So when you have this natural inclination as a person, a human, to try to get justice or vindicate what's gone wrong, let that go because God will vindicate. We have so many promises in the scripture. God vindicates. God will make that right. But we can't get hold on to that or it will pull us down very quickly. So the question I have here is, how do you stay out of love? Is that on yours? No, it is not on yours, but I will tell you. How do you stay out of love? Or fall out of love? You stay angry. To the extent that you will stay angry will be the extent to which your relationship will fail. Okay, as I said, the heart cannot hold two opposing emotions at the same time. Okay, additional advice on conflict. I know we're going through this quickly, but there's other things we need to get to do. Don't give unwanted advice. I'm sorry, men often want to fix things. Women just want an ear to listen to them. Don't give unwanted advice. Number two, choose your battles carefully. Some battles are not worth fighting because of what they're going to do in the aftermath to the relationship. Okay, when you're angry, rate your intensity of your feelings. You have a worksheet in here I'll show you that's going to help you with that. If you're angry, you can say, I feel about a nine angry right now or a two angry. It's really important when you're angry with someone to communicate what level you're at. That can help them be more prepared to know how to deal with what's happening. Okay, number four, don't use any put downs or condescension. That is like throwing fuel on the fire. <clears throat> like saying something like, well, you always get angry when I do this. Or, you know, you a, a statement, something like that, okay? Number five, don't look, <clears throat> don't look at what's going wrong all the time. Look for something good because you would not be having a conflict if you didn't care about each other. People don't have conflict that are apathetic toward each other. They just don't care. So the silver lining and when you're in a conflict is that there is a reason why you care enough to fight about something. So that's what you want to go back to. And number six, one of my uh, favorite verses in the scriptures on conflict, because it has so many qualifiers in it, is in Romans, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Okay, now, let's go to financial stress, which I said before is the number one source of conflict in marriage. How do you resolve financial stress? Um, the average American family before the COVID virus was only five house or rent payments away from a homeless shelter. Only five payments away from being homeless. The virus now has caused that to shrink. And some families are far more in the category of only two to three house payments or rent payments before they have no place to go. Think of all the people that lost their jobs. Some of that, that happened instantly. They lost their places immediately. And some did not. Some had money set aside or some were able to find some kind of work to help them get through this. So my point in saying this is that the family is under tremendous amount of financial stress normally, but in a, a pandemic, it just is very, very much accelerated. So one of the things you need to do is, number one, realistically figure out how much you owe in your finances. What do you owe? What do you have to pay back? The second thing that you have to do, and um, budgeting is incredibly important with uh, marriage couples because that's the one financial thing that breaks up the marriage more than any other. The second thing you need to do is increase your income and reduce your debt. That is true at every stage of your life. If at all possible to increase income, reduce debt, 
brainstorm with creativity about how to do this. And you might come up with some fabulous ways to push your relationship with your financial stress forward and not backward. Okay, so the third thing is become accountable to someone you respect with financial advice and expertise, someone who knows this. Uh, in the military, we use Dave Ramsey. We love Dave Ramsey. I don't know if you've ever heard of him before, but Financial Peace University is like, um, it should be in your foundation of your marriage. And right now, he's giving this program free for 14 days because it's usually got a price to it. The thing is you have to watch it together because you will learn so much about finances and about how to start off your relationship right and be where you really wanna be in a very few short years. And you will have avoided the biggest conflict in all of marriage breakups if you just follow those through. Okay, next thing, sexual unfulfillment, which we'll talk a little bit about later. It's often the cause of a passionless marriage. There are two things you can do to help this immediately. The first thing is not to blame or shame your partner. Because in intimate situations, we are our most vulnerable and that impacts the relationship in a much deeper way if we feel any blame or shame for what's happening or not happening uh, in that area. The second thing is get professional help. This is not an area that we've got any training about as we're growing up or we know how to do this. It's all kind of trial and error. In today's society, 75% of men have affairs. That's a pretty unbelievable statistic. The saddest thing is, is that 50% of women now have affairs. So if you want to affair-proof your marriage, the causes for sexual unfulfillment or lack of intimacy are very crucial to get those worked out. And that's why sometimes, because it's a touchy topic, you have to be able to get some professional help that will help you with uh, some of the, the details of what you need to work on. Okay, so those are, that's just a highlight. Now we're gonna go to this conflict pyramid. It should be called mm -hmm. communication pyramid, but when I wrote it for the article, they did it, they called it the conflict pyramid. So what, is, what this is, is this will give you an understanding of how conflict happens and what you need to do to cure it, to work through it. And these are some very helpful ways. If you don't know these things, you'll never know what you're fighting about or how to pull out of an argument. The tip of the iceberg is that, oh, let's think here first I wrote, when you're experiencing conflict, there is an order to the way it progresses understanding this dynamic as a lengthy yet predictable process can help you reconcile conflict with your partner. Um, a conflict is like an archaeological dig where the surface things are at the very top, the deeper things are levels and levels and levels deeper. And that's how conflict happens. But you can do this communication through here and make it very understandable. First thing in conflict that we always see, it's like that red flag waving that I said before, is that somebody is anger, angry. Somebody's angry, that means something went wrong. And anger is our go-to emotion for our survival skills. It, like I said, it's hardwired in us, and we become angry in order to protect ourselves. But it's what we do with that anger that makes it good or not so good for us. But underneath the anger, what made us anger, angry was something hurt us. So we've got to talk through our conflicts like, well, what hurt you or what happened that caused you to feel hurt? That's the first level we go below anger is hurt, okay? The next level is there's fear beneath hurt. This is getting deeper now. Um, so you have to discover what was that fear that happened to cause the conflict. Okay, then underneath that, our unmet needs are discovered. Remember I said unmet needs, the other word for that is expectations, are like the foundation of what will set the tone for your marriage. That's why we spent the time on that so you will know how to identify what those unmet needs are. If you have a pen, 
I usually do this in red. Make a squiggly line underneath unmet needs that goes all the way across, okay? Because we're gonna shift gears here. Everything above that red line will point to illness. Psychological illness, physical illness, emotional illness. If you don't work through them and discover how to help with whatever is happening in the situation. Everything below that red squiggly line, the last two things on that pyramid, is healing. So you'll need to distinguish where we're cutting this off. The problem with the last two is that these are not human virtues. We don't naturally, as people, have the power to forgive and freely do that because we have protective mechanisms that want to keep us from getting hurt again. That's our natural response. So forgiveness is very difficult. That's a godly virtue. And that's our first clue that we have to have the spiritual help to get through some of these things. So godly virtue is forgiveness. That comes from God. The second thing and the most important thing is that peace and unconditional love are only from God. And we can't unlock those until we work through all of these things here. That's why I say if you stop at your unmet needs and you don't go deeper, you can keep that in you the anger in you and the problems that it's causing and it will cause illness in your life on all levels but if you can get below that with some spiritual help you will have the godly virtues to heal whatever it is whatever issues that caused you to go here so tell me how long does it take to have an emotion a split second Exactly. You can't count it. It's like that, like that. There's no time. We can't in research time emotions. They're too quick. Okay, nanoseconds. Okay. So how long does it take to have a thought? Less than that. Actually, it takes three to 10 seconds, which took you 10 seconds to give me that answer. Okay, as I count. <laughs> The, re the problem with this is, is that when something affects us, and it can be a subtle thing that happens in our environment, or like a frightening thing, like a car almost hit us, or something like that, our emotion goes from level to that in less time than we could ever even count it. So the problem is, when we can react that quickly to the top of the pyramid of anger, to the peak of it, when we're already reacting, our brain cannot catch up with us. So we act out of illogical feelings and we say um, things that we don't really mean because our brain can't catch up with our uh, heart and our emotions, okay? It takes a lot of exercises. Like for people that have high anxiety, I do lots of exercises with them to slow down this process. Because, and that's what you're gonna do by working through these things, you're gonna to learn to slow down the process so that conflict doesn't have to always be negative. It doesn't always have to be hurtful. It can work through that, okay? So let's say uh, I'm really angry about something. I have to think about what hurt me to make me angry, okay? For example, uh, I was expecting somebody to do something for me and they didn't follow through. The hurt might feel like, even though it's not logical, it might feel like, well, that person didn't care enough for me to know that that would be important to me. So that would hurt. But what's the fear beneath the hurt? The fear is maybe they never cared enough. Maybe they'll never care enough again. And that's a real fear for people. Underneath that are unmet needs. What are the bedrock unmet need of my anger, my hurt, and my fear? That unmet need might have been, I always counted on that person to be there for me, and they weren't. Okay, now did that person know that I had that expectation? Not unless I expressed it. That's why these exercises are so important for you to go through. When you are angry, work through these like this. Get every argument that you have, get through this, and then you will figure out the next part, forgiveness, and then peace and unconditional love. 
when you're here more than you're up here, you are in that mature phase of your marriage. Okay, so this is a very important graph for you to pay attention to. Okay, now I know we're rushing. So I'm going to say this one on anger responses. Pay attention to this because there's really only one healthy quadrant here that is uh, going to serve you for the rest of your life to stay out of anger. Okay, the first one is the healthy relationship. You see the, the two people here, the relationship is in between them. It's out in the open, but it's not loud. It's not violent. All right. The second one is over on the side is the aggressor and the suppressor. That's the person when they get mad or always just pounding verbally onto the other person, name calling, all that. And they're holding all this anger, suppressing it inside of them. Okay. That's the kind of person that one day comes home and their house is cleared up, cleared out, their spouse is gone, and they never even knew what was coming. Because you can only suppress for so long before you flee to get away from it, okay? This one, too very verbal, is debatable. Some cultures see this as normal. Where you're both loud about it or you're both not doing negative things or saying negative things but you've just both got the conflict out there it's it's stronger than up here it's out there okay some cultures react like that as long as it is not um negative toward each other or harmful in any way it's okay all right it's not like you're throwing things you're not hurting anybody okay this one is the worst one of all though that's when you both deny conflict and you both suppress it and after a while you have no relationship at all so look at these graphs and figure out how are you doing conflict that's going to be an important part of understanding that for your relationship another homework assignment is this positive confrontation moving out of the disenchantment phase of marriage that we've talked about so much here are your steps that's a date night thing when you are not in conflict, when you are having a normal time and you're not upset about anything. I gave you a second page also to help give you more information. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do that today. Here's a graph. And this goes back, speaks to the family of origin issues I told you about that are so important. How was it okay to show anger in your families when you grew up? So be honest answer the questions, do this together, and then I'll give you a hint, only the last four are healthy. Anything beyond that is not healthy, but it happens. And this is an awareness exercise, all right? Has to be about awareness. Okay, on the next page, I give you an anger thermometer. This is a really important tool to talk about where, remember I said ranking your anger, like saying I'm a nine or I'm a two. Okay, this is where you're gonna use this and you're gonna write in the things that get you up to this point and what things are normal and what things you just don't even engage with, okay? If there's any question about that, you can email me and I can tell you how to do that, okay. So what I've given you next are the legal definitions of equality and relationships. And on the back side, the legal definitions of inequality or negative power and control. So look through these because uh, most of the time we don't have this kind of explanation or knowledge about what is non-threatening behavior, what is threatening behavior, because some people are not threatened by the same things that others are. Okay, so. And I will say in our archdiocese, especially when we come to the violence or control and all that, we have a zero tolerance policy for any kind of domestic abuse. So you need to know that. Okay. After anger always comes forgiveness. So there's a, there's a process of forgiveness. Remember I said, until you work through those levels, you will not get to this. But this is how to do forgiveness. These are the steps. And most people don't know there are steps to forgiveness. All right. 
And then here are some practice things that you can do together to actually practice on the other side of that, what you're gonna be able to do. Okay, so I am sorry this is so rushed. I wish we could spend time and really process this. That means the burden will be on you for this material, that you, you will need to work through it. You'll need to hold yourself to finishing it, to going through the things that we've been talking about, not forgetting to do them because uh, like I said, I'd really love for you to take this apart and work on them at different times and then to put some of these up, like this prayer, make a home altar, like what's behind me, this is our home altar, and our icons and our uh, patron saints and all that is here. That's what you need to start with and put that prayer up because like Father James said, it's a beautiful way to start the day. Okay, so... That's the introduction to conflict, and it does not do it justice. And my apologies. Uh, there are so many things in communication and conflict I couldn't go through today. And one of the most important ones were the gender differences. Uh, the gender differences in how we communicate and also in how we do conflict. Those are very important to understand. Maybe we'll have a seminar someday when we'll just go through the more depth about how this works for us, okay? I think this very enlightening, and a lot of the people in the seminars that hear these things for the first time, it's like light bulbs go off, and they say, I never knew that that's what was happening in our relationship. So um, I put a lot of work into this, and I hope that you will actually take a good look at it and work on it. So what did I say the formula was for uh, maintaining our marriage? Date night, how often? Yeah, I'm sorry, you moved away from the mic a little, so we, we missed that last okay. little question. Okay, so what did, I say, what did I say the formula was for uh, maintaining your relationship as far as times together? Date night weekly, uh, one day a month away with your spouse, and then four times a year overnight away with the spouse. Great notes. You get a star. <laughs> Okay, that's the minimum, remember, the minimum. All the couples I have in counseling gave this up a long time ago, or they never even knew they had to plow that much time into their marriage. Remember we talked about investment earlier? You invest in what you value. If you're not investing in the relationship, you're showing yourself and your partner that you're not, in, you're not valuing it to the extent that you need to, okay? All right, are we, I think we have enough time to get to intimacy. Do we have enough time? Sonia, are we doing good? Okay, we're doing good. Sorry, I was okay. muted. You're doing great. Um, we have 20 minutes until one o'clock. I don't know how much time you have. If you want to have a few extra minutes and don't mind, whoever I don't wants mind. to. I don't mind at all, but I would prefer just to get through the material and let them just throw the questions at me because that won't slow this process down for those that have to go. Okay. Um, could you stop the recording for just a second? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so next you have your um, worksheet, the physical dimension of marriage. All right, we're going to fill this out now. And this is something that if you're not married yet, it's okay to talk about now, but you really won't understand what we're going through until you're in that place in marriage where physical intimacy is a part of your regular life, okay? So I'm gonna give you, and, and this is a much longer workshop, but I'm gonna give you the highlights, okay? So why is sex important? And if, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with the term sex, we can say intimacy. But basically what we're talking about here is physical intimacy. Okay, why is it important? First, because, oh, not, this is just a um, qualifying statement, because it's sanctified by God in the sacrament of marriage. And that's the only context in which I offer these insights. I don't offer these insights for couples that are cohabiting, but for couples who, in the context of marriage, is what these insights are about. Okay, so number one, for many men, Sexuality is the key to helping them connect and realize their feelings. 
okay? It's the key for men to connect with their feelings. Number two, sex or intimacy allows a man to feel his need for love. While receiving love helps a woman feel her need for intimacy. So we're made differently in this realm. Men need to have intimacy to connect. Women need to connect to have intimacy. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Okay. Number three, when sex or intimacy gets better, the whole relationship automatically gets deeper and richer. Okay, number four, we know that there are so many health benefits caused by the release of sexual hormones. Very important part of who we are in our bodies. Okay, so why do some couples stop having intimacy? Number one, one or both partners lose interest. Uh, the disinterest is usually caused because certain conditions for wanting intimacy are not fulfilled. Remember, I talked about those two. Men need to feel, have intimacy to feel. Women need to feel to have it, one intimacy. So that's one of the things. Um, it's the conditions are not right the way they should be. Okay, so in this area in particular, as we talked about before, it's our most vulnerable state with another person. So if if it's easier or less painful to not deal with that part of our vulnerability or who we are, it's, or to be frustrated, it's easier just to lose interest. So talking about this is a really important uh, key to knowing how you can bridge this gap and have this communication. For some people, it's not easy to talk about. And maybe in our families of origin, we, we didn't talk about any of this stuff. I don't think you ever had a high school class other than health that talked about the intimate details of how you build on an intimate relationship. Uh, most people have no, no um, any kind of education. And so that's what you're gonna do with each other in the context of your marriage, and you're gonna to begin to build on your expectations, which remember I said, that's the tone of your marriage, what your expectations are. Okay, and number three, one or both partners are too demanding. Whenever you're demanding intimacy, it's not going to happen. Intimacy has to be cultivated and not demanded. Okay, so uh, in order to create a fulfilling sexual relationship, a couple must, number one, approach changes slowly. Okay, and number two, Suspend any judgment or criticism of your partner. Okay, I think that makes sense when I say that we're so vulnerable that criticism or um, judgment will make us pull away even further. Okay, three main ways to improve sex. Okay, number one, always when it's shared in a loving, committed relationship. And I'd add married relationship to that. Married meaning equaling commitment. Okay. Number two is the longevity of the relationship. So if you're doing the things you need to be communicating, resolving conflict, and paying attention to the things we've talked about today, the longer your relationship, the better everything gets. And the intimacy part of our relationship is improved by the longer that we are together. Okay. So the third way is to improve the skills in lovemaking, both emotional and physical. Most of lovemaking or intimacy is psychology. So working on the emotional, paying attention to what the other partner needs is a very important part of that. That's what your improvement of skills is all about. Okay, so difference in sexual uh, expectation between a man and a woman. Primarily, as we know, the difference is physiological. The hormones that cause a man to be aroused quickly are also released very quickly after orgasm. But the hormones that are released when a woman is aroused build very slowly and remain a long time after the sexual experience. We're very different physiologically in that way. 
Okay, for a woman, for example, arousal or sexual interest, intimacy, interest, builds slowly long before it becomes a physical desire for sex. A woman has to feel warm, sensual, and attractive. She needs to spend time relating to her husband in a deep way before even desiring sex. And honestly, guys, this could take days. So that's something you have to learn to be patient with in order for your spouse to feel secure. Okay, so in, in, to sum that up, in a very real sense, emotional support from the male is the price of admission. Okay, men need sex to feel loved, just as a woman needs love to be open to sex. And a man needs sex to be open to love. So we've got this little bit of this infinity thing going on here, the infinity symbol where we go back and forth and back and forth in our needs and our expectations. And we have to learn how to understand that ebb and flow between the two of us and how we can actually work to make that uh, together, okay? Gender differences in sex. I have it yeah, I will do one thing on gender difference. Okay, a man needs only two to three minutes of stimulation to attain orgasm. A woman needs 10 times more time to be sexually fulfilled, 20 to 30 minutes. So you've got some patience there that you gotta work on. Okay, also, a woman's skin is 10 times more sensitive than a man's. 10 times is huge. That's why we notice subtle differences in the temperature. We're cold long before you even know that a window's open or a door's open. We feel things in our skin because we have 10 times more sensors than males do, okay? So subtle, non-direct touch for a female is the key to arousal. Subtle, non-direct touch, and your partner can guide you with what that means to her. Okay, so another very important thing to remember, during sex, women slow down while men speed up. In order to change that difference and make it uh, the best experience for both of you, the male can match the rhythm of the wife's breathing to be in tune with her pace. That one subtle change of pay attention to her breathing and pace yourself with that will make all the difference, okay? In order to grow in sexual fulfillment, males need to feel successful in fulfilling their wife. Males need to feel emotionally supported. Both of those are intimacy. One is emotional, one is physical, but they are the same when it comes to uh, emotional vulnerability and intimacy, okay? A man needs sexual release to relax. Also remember to get in touch with his feelings, but a woman has to relax and disconnect from her surroundings before she can be intimate. So think of it this way. If a woman has so much on her plate that she can't even begin to think about having time together, the best thing that the husband can do is take some of that off her plate. Let her finish what she needs to do. Ask for what you can do to help. Maybe it's helping with the dishes. Maybe it's putting the kids to bed. Whatever it is, it's a very important point to remember for a female. We carry all the stuff on our plate all the time we have to learn how to take things off so that we can get to intimacy, okay? Okay, so a man is usually visually aroused by the physical body, but a woman desires to get to know the inner man first before she's open to intimacy. In a relationship, a man develops love from the outside in, but the female gradually loves from the inside out. That's why it takes time to be vulnerable and feel good about where you are in this because you're coming from different places. Okay, um, a man will fake, confidential, or fake confidence in sexuality while a woman will fake physical satisfaction. So don't pressure your partner to change this. You have to learn how to grow together and have a lot of patience, okay? Okay, so men, are like the sun, always rising, while women are like the moon, waxing and waning, depending on her phase, full moon, half moon, 
new moon and all the phases in between, her intimacy needs will vary from just cuddling to full orgasmic expression, depending on where she is in that cycle. Okay, men don't have that cycle. All right, so talking about sex, this is an important thing. The best time to have a talk about intimacy is when you've just experienced a good time of intimacy or at a neutral time when there's no pressure. And I really think that's the better time when there's no pressure. Some families don't grow up calling uh, or talking about sexual things. So sometimes you have to learn to do some code words or <clears throat> phrases that are not offensive to either partner. Or if you don't want anybody else in the home, especially your children, to know what you're talking about. Okay, you can also develop indirect sexual signals and rituals to initiate intimacy when communication about it is difficult. So that's up to your imagination. How do you have indirect signals? What do you do in your communication to, to let the other person know that you're open to intimacy? That's something you'll grow into in your relationship. Remember that great sex or intimacy begins with love and the partner who feels loved first will respond more freely and be more open to discuss intimacy if it's not mechanical or pressured. And also both partners need to clearly express their sexual needs and desires and practice in an unhurried, undemanding and uncritical environment. Okay, so it's also a time in which, as I said before, we can experience our most, our deepest rejection because of our level of vulnerability or our deepest openness also. Okay, so um, do we have the goals to sexual intimacy on this birthday? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to give you 10 keys. It's not on your sheet, but you've got room to write it in. 10 keys to intimacy. Number one, define sexual goals. Remember, this is just a part of our life like any other. It's a very deep part of our life. So we need to define that and have a discussion about it. Okay, number two, ensure mutual satisfaction. Number three, pursue sexual knowledge. Now, in a healthy way. If you don't know about something, it's always easy to learn. Okay, number four, identify problems. And this is the second area in a marriage where you have to get professional help. The first one was financial, to be accountable, to get professional help. The second one is in your intimacy. Uh, if there are problems, you need a professional to help you with that. Like I said, you don't have the education to do that. So men, number five, affirm your spouse and adore. And women lead intimacy by your initiation. Men, number seven, slow down. And women, learn to accept sexual intimacy even when you think you have too much going on to pay attention to it. Number nine, have fun, laugh about it. It's part of the enjoyment. And number 10, accept mutual responsibility. Okay, so remember, great sex or intimacy is a reward for the commitment to create a loving and supportive relationship. It also brightens and rejuvenates the mind, body, and spirit. There are so many studies on how good sexuality and healthy sexuality affect the body, the mind, and the spirit. So uh, any questions about that? Could you cover five through eight again one more time? Five through eight, okay, quickly. I will do uh, number five, men. Affirm and adore. Women. And in there too, please. Number two. Nine. Nine. Oh, wait a minute. He said five through nine. Did you? I said five through eight, but five through nine is perfect. Okay. Number five, you got number six, women. 
lead by initiation. Number seven, men, slow down. Number eight, women, learn to accept intimacy even when you don't think you've got the time for it. Number nine, have fun, enjoy the experience. And number 10, accept mutual responsibility. Okay. So the thing that most men don't get is how sensitive females are, how sensitive their bodies are, and how too much touch or too kind of the wrong kind of touch for a female is a real turnoff. That's what you got to discuss uh, with each other. Your relationship will be unique because you're both unique. So that's why having a good um, conversation about this together is going to help build part of that foundation for your relationship that's going to be very important for you. Okay? All right. Any other questions? This is always something you can email me about also. If you'd rather not talk in your group about it, I completely understand. But what you got to realize is that it is part of life, a part of a normal marriage relationship, and it can be a very empowering way to be uh, close together, like I said earlier. All right. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to go on. One of our next to last things is goals. Remember I talked about goals earlier, and I have a sheet for you called Making Goals. I broke this down for you because it's very important for your relationship. So just by a show of hands, how many of you had written goals for your marriage? Okay, I see one couple, two couples maybe. Okay, written goals for your marriage. Now, we know that only 3%, 3%, only 3% of married couples ever had written goals for their marriage, and we wonder why half of them divorce. So what are goals in your relationship? What function do they fulfill? They put us kind of on the same page, on the same direction. Absolutely. They're your roadmap. Your goals are your roadmap. So if you don't have written goals that you've written and taken time to do together, you're going to be going like a different ways, in different ways. At first, it may not seem very far apart. But as your expectations start guiding your behavior, you're going to separate more and more like that, okay? That's why you've got to write down your goals. And I include all areas of your life. You've got a whole packet full of information that you can write goals about. Communication goals, conflict goals, um, intimacy goals, financial goals, spiritual goals. Remember, there's that whole, in the self-care strategy sheet, I put all of these together so you'll know all the areas that you should have some goals. Now, don't make them overwhelming and don't make them too far out in the future because realistically, we can only do about a year ahead at a time. Okay? So I wrote down the rules for goals about how they need to be reachable. They need to be quantifiable, meaning... How much money are you putting in your 401k? To the penny. That's what I mean by quantifiable. How many times are we going to have a date night? That's quantifiable. Okay. They also need to be associated with the timeline, which is what I said, not longer than a year, except for financial goals, which automatically keep you keep adding to, or you take care of that part. And it that's something you set in motion. All right. Um, so when you start this goal worksheet, and on the back of this, I put a very simple little way to make a goal and how you expand, can you see that? How you expand it out into actual reachable uh, steps that you're gonna take. So you can take that and copy it as many times as you want and you can write down a goal. Maybe on a date night, choose one area that you wanna make a goal for. Some couples do that on their overnight away. They'll, do, they'll make it like a goal overnight time or um, a time away where they're not interrupted by the jobs, their families. They have a lot of time to sit and think about it. But I wouldn't make so many goals that they feel unreachable. Maybe five, 
choose the five areas that are most important to you and plug those into goals. And then all of a sudden, life just starts clicking along for you because you're on, the, you're on your map together, you're going down the road, you know what's gonna happen, and it resolves a lot of conflict. Okay, so this gives you a little bit more experience about what are goals, how they're personalized, they're written down in a positive manner, um, and they're a place where you can see them often. They challenge you to move forward, and they have a time frame to enable you to see the end. That's why we don't want goals too far out because we can't really see that far away, you know? With children, for example, it can be one day, a one day goal, that's all they can handle. Uh, fifth, sixth graders, maybe a week goal, you know, in, and older, even teenagers, don't, aren't even able to expand out the future for them. Okay, so you gotta be careful with how much you, you don't wanna overload yourself with goals, but you most definitely want to have them. All right. So what we did not get to today was the gender differences, as I said before, in communication and in conflict. We did not get to personality, which is a really fun one, personality. We did not get to birth order, which is a very important thing in your family of origin expectations. Um, we didn't get to more lengthy communication exercises, and uh, we didn't really spend a lot of time on any one area. So what you've got is like a 30,000 foot view of what your relationship uh, can be, and you also can kind of got an idea of how much it's going to take to get there, don't you? Okay, so remember, you got to do this together. It's not one person doing all the work. It's together. It's working as a team. It's learning how to do that as partners. All right? Okay, so would you have any questions for any of this now? Because I'm willing to take questions about any of the topics that we've talked about. Uh, yes, I have one question. Um, I don't really, uh, you mentioned birth order. Like, can you give like a couple of sentences about this topic or what? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe well, I'm... It's, it's one of my very favorite subjects, first of all. You have to know that it's one of my very favorite subjects. And it is the one research project in any um, field that will get instant funding for. It's very difficult to get funding for research because there's not that many research dollars going around anymore, but research on birth order will get an instant grant because it is so predictable. And if you're doing research, you wanna have a good outcome for your research, don't you? So you wanna pick a topic that you know is going to be consistent. At least that's how I did doctoral research, okay? So birth order is very, very important because it forms the person that you are. Not only, um, I mean, every area of your life, like how you filter things in life, how you look at things in life, the patience you have for people or not, the way you communicate. We have very different communication patterns depending on the order of where we were born. Father James, what's your birth order? You're number one? Okay, all right. So can I pick on you? Yes. I can. Okay. Okay. So firstborns, for example, are the most intense personality because you are the first one that comes along and your parents did not have a rule book about how to raise a child. So they raised him and I'm a firstborn too, raised him like a little adult because all they know is their experience. So they put the firstborn on a pedestal and that firstborn has to earn that because the parents are already assuming that they have the brightest, the smartest, the most brilliant child ever, which Father James was. Yes, I was. So, yes. So, uh, and they expect him to act like a little adult. But he didn't have the cognitive or the emotional skills to do that. So he had to learn how to compensate. And how he compensated with that was that he always rose to the top of whatever he was doing. Okay, there's a phrase I like to use, the cream always rises to the top. All right, so firstborns are traditionally that one that will rise to the top of any task. 
They will be the leader. We have more presidents that were firstborns than any other birth order. They are the ones that will take care of you in ways that other birth orders will not. They, their weaknesses are though, they will take on too much. That's not their fault. That was expected by their parents of them. So any other firstborns in here that I'm speaking to? Okay, good. So there's some others in here. Okay. So we, um, our weakness, because I'll include myself, is that we, unless we had siblings very far later than we were born, we never learned how to have a childhood and how to play. So think about what the messages were that were given to you as a child. Go get your brother's bottle. Can you help me do this? Will you watch after your sister? It was constantly, we are sitting and playing by ourselves as a child and the parent interrupts us because they see us as a co-parent mistakenly, but they don't know it's a mistake. And they're always bringing you in to do responsible chores. So let's say uh, uh, Father James is sitting there playing with his Legos and he's there about five minutes and his mom says, go do this for me or can you help me with that? Or uh, so he does it, he comes back, he starts to play with his Legos and two minutes later, something else is asked of him. So he jumps up and he goes and does that. The third or fourth time, he doesn't wanna play anymore because he knows he's gonna to have to be ready for whatever is next, okay? That's the typical life of a firstborn. The only way to cure that is to learn how to play and have fun. So, Father, is your wife a firstborn? Yes. Okay, I thought so. I thought so. So she's doing the same thing. So my husband's a firstborn too. Now, I'm not saying anything about Father James' marriage. <laughs> they are the but. Firstborns are the most competitive because we have to be to get to the top, all right? So when you have two firstborns in a marriage, there's a lot of competition in the marriage. Now, it doesn't have to be necessarily over who's doing what particular thing better. It has to do with how high are we gonna go, whether it's in our field or whether it's in our interest or whatever. So firstborn couples especially need to learn how to recreate through play and have um, undemanded time. Now I can imagine Father James never gets that with a parish your size, but that's exactly what he needs for his healing and for his wife. So them getting time away is crucial for both of them, okay? Only children somewhat fall into that, but the problem with them is that, yes, they were the um, only adults around them, so they were raised as little adults. They also don't have a childhood. The problem with only children is the parents default to them and always ask them, what would you like for dinner? Where would you like to go? What would you like for this or whatever? Because metaphorically, they have their, all their eggs in one basket and they don't wanna tip over the basket and lose that one child. So they're made to grow up in ways that they can't handle, which makes them very difficult to um, manage relationships later in life. So, so, Korea, can I tell you how we deal with that? Yes, because I'd love to hear that because- You, have, you nailed us. Yeah. Um, but uh, we learned very, very early, even just as we were friends. I mean, I feel like I married my best friend. We met at a camp right. and uh, we, um, you know, got to see the good, the bad and the ugly. We were, it was a long term relationship all the way up until when we were married. So um, and we started our relationship together at, at in a, just a very stressful, hard time. I was at seminary. She was leaving. She had to move to Boston with me and get a job. We've both been working the whole time and we're very busy. But we figured out very early that although we're not able to take these four, you know, once a month weekend trips like you were talking about and, um, and uh, some of those other uh, tips you gave, every single day we walk together. Oh, wonderful. And usually it's, mm -hmm. usually it's between two and four miles, usually oh, great. four, great. even in the great. winter, even in the snow. Mm -hmm. Um, in between the breaks of the rain, but we go every day. Uh -huh. Sometimes, sometimes Beautiful. we talk the whole time. Sometimes we don't. But we're just yeah. together. And uh -huh. it started. It started before we were even married at Antiochian Village. We would walk early oh, before we got very, up and our kids woke up. So very nice. It's very nice because it puts us on equal uh, ground. And yeah. We yes. Just talk, yes. Talk through a lot because there is a competitive thing. Yes. <laughs> yes, there is. And. Yes, but we can't help that. That was put into us, you know? Yeah, interesting. We knew that by the time we were two. 
what our life was going to be about. Um, and our parents did that to us, but I said not in a necessarily negative way. So and we raised our number one, our, our first child, Zoe, like she was a 16 year old as an infant. Yeah, of course you did. So, <laughs> you repeated kid, the pattern. Yes, yes, a, yes. Uh -huh. I never saw her as a baby. <laughs> uh -huh, that's right, right. So to that point, since Father James had a firstborn female, firstborn females are the strongest personality types of all personalities. Um, and if you have a friend like that, you, you could count yourself blessed because they will do anything for you. And they will, they will find a way to make it happen. So she probably is like that today, your daughter, okay? Any other questions about that? Because we could go on for two or three hours because like I said, it's totally predictable. We know what the outcome is gonna be. Even if there's other uh, extenuating circumstances in your family, you're going to fit your birth order. And where you sit in a room, what colors you wear, what car you drive, who your friends are, what you do with your spare time or none, no spare time is all determined by that. It's really uncanny how much we live our birth orders. Okay? And the personality is the other component of that. Both our, com our personality and our uh, birth order um, dovetail in a way that makes us who we are. And that's fascinating too. Okay? We'll have you out to cover some more of these topics. Yeah, it'd be fun. It'd be fun. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I'd like to end with a prayer if there's no more questions. Okay. For, uh, I did Dr. have one. Hawk. Okay. Um, one like you were saying, will there be an opportunity to um, meet again with Dr. Maggie or will yes. you be send out any tools? With yeah, as soon as we feel it's safe enough and we're able to get, you know, I mean, I think we're going to have to find out if this coronavirus is going to have another life. Um, maybe we can have her out in the fall. If we can't, we'll have to do it maybe, um, you know, after the new year or something. I don't know, but it'll, it'll be uh, soon and we might have to have a double seminar. I'd like her to talk about some other topics as well. So but maybe one day we can do marriage and then the next day um, we can do, uh, you know, another topic on mental health or something. That's wonderful. Sounds wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a specific time in mind yet, but we'll... That's we'll, fine. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know my travel schedule yet either, but uh, we'll, we'll work it out. We will, and we'll, we'll, we'll let all of you know, and we'll probably invite the whole parish mm -hmm. if we can, so... Okay, anything else, Sonia? Announcements? I mean, I don't... I, I did send um, Dr. Maggie's email to everybody in the chat, so in case you didn't get a chance to write it down, I did send it to you. Thank and you. if you... Um, once I... We finish and I have the recording set. I will try to share that with you. I hope I can figure it out. Um, but if you do have any other questions, you can email me or you can give us a call at the office. Um, and of course, any specific questions for Dr. Maggie, you know she's invited you to email her as well. So thank you all very much for your um, patience today. And uh, yeah, and then Father, we can just uh, finish off if you don't mind. Beautiful. Thank you again for being with us. We look forward to the day when uh, we will meet you at the Holy Altar. Yes, for, yes. Uh, for your wedding and uh, the day when we can come back together and celebrate yeah. during your reception, whenever and wherever that may be. Right. But let's, uh, let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, we thank you and we ask your blessings upon all those who have participated today, especially our presenter, Gloria Maggie and her family, our host, Sonia and her family and all of the couples participating in this workshop today. We ask that you bless them, that you guide them, that you protect them, and that you shower them with your mercy and your grace. And Lord, we also ask that you fill our hearts with unflinching faith in your protection, in your hope, and in your help, and in your love for you and for our neighbors. For yours it is to have mercy and to save us, O Christ our God, and unto you we ascribe glory, honor, and worship to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. 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 God bless you. Please you. give a hug to your father, if I he's will. still living, and remember him. <laughs> no, and, they uh, lo I, lost, I lost both of my parents. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, they, I, they both went quickly, so that's 
we knew that it was coming. Though, but so. we remember them every single day. Thank you. Thank you. So. Love to you, Father George and to your wives. Thank you. Okay. God Congratulations you. on all the weddings coming up. Thank you so much for everything. Have a wonderful afternoon. Call us if you need anything regarding okay. your upcoming weddings. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Nice Bye. to meet you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maggie. Was this was excellent, even for not not an about to be married person, but, yeah, yeah. but just, uh, just rushed way too much. But that's okay. I, I mean, I, it's understandable. There's we. I feel like we did cover a good amount of information today, too. Oh um, yeah, they got they got a lot to work on. Yes, for sure, for sure. So if anybody didn't, you know, needs this again, let me know. You should have all gotten it already. But if there's um, if you don't have that PDF, I can send it to you. And, I have a uh, question. The man. I have a question. The man that asked about birth order. What is his birth order? Leo. Um, I'm second. I'm the second born. Oh, okay. Uh, older brother or sister? Older brother. Okay. So, are you particularly bonded to your mother? Uh, compared to my father, or or just? Yeah. In the, um. Ooh, tough question. I, I would say equally. I, I wouldn't. Uh, uh, equally, probably. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Do you, do you have dreams of chasing? Chasing who? Just or like... chasing. Chasing. Do you chase people in your dreams? <laughs> um, sometimes I chase my fiance, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so there's a reason for that. You're chasing your brother for his position. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so firstborns, I was going to ask Father James, because as firstborns, we have dreams of falling. Very common. All the time. Yeah. That's so interesting. Because really our parents put us on a pedestal, and we're worried about falling off the pedestal. So we dream about falling all the time. <laughs> I'm the oldest of six, and I find this topic yeah. really interesting as well. Huh. And I've read about it a little bit, and uh, and that's kind of weird because I do have dreams about falling. So that's yes, kind of yeah. uh -huh. I'm the yeah. oldest. And I think I'm an outlier. <laughs> oh, okay. Why is that? I just didn't. Uh, nothing you said resonated with me really. Ah, okay. So there might be some family dynamics that are is very unusual though, because like I said, the the research is very consistent about that. So. Okay. There are, I have I, heard of like certain like variables too. Like there are you, variables. Yes. If you have a but, large family, male or female first. Yes. If yes uh -huh. The oldest two are really close in age. If they're twins, if right. there's like kind of different. In his case is in his case. I think it would speak to how his parents raised him, with balance. I would think that is probably where his um, orientation is coming from, is that they didn't they didn't put those expectations on him like a normal parent would. So for that, you can thank your parents because they were very wise to let you have your childhood. I yeah. wonder if any of it has to do with the, the cultural differences too, growing up in Germany. Uh, possibly. Although German personalities are very strong. So I mm -hmm. spend time in Germany from time to time. It depends on the family so much. So yeah, it's a long discussion. We could spend a lot of time on it. <laughs> because there are different different variables that do come in uh, to all of this. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. We will email you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll see you on Skype sometime. Okay. Yeah. Thank all you right. so much. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Maggie. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye.